So good afternoon, everybody. Hello and welcome to the conference for the launch of the European Social Economy Action Plan. Welcome to those of you who have joined us in person and also to those who are following us online in Europe and beyond. Let me just give you a few pieces of basic admin so that we can all collaborate effectively this afternoon. We will be using Slido to collect your questions. So please go to slido.com and there you need to put in the code SEAP2021 or you should have displayed on your screen the QR code that you can use to go there. That's where we're going to collect questions that I'll be putting to the panel because this afternoon is designed to be as interactive as possible. If you're tweeting or using social media, please use the hashtags SEAP and social economy. We're delighted to welcome you here in La Tricoterie, which is a social enterprise itself. In fact, it won an award in Belgium for the best social economy activity in 2016. It is an event and hospitality space and all the profits that are used that are generated through these activities are reinvested in the venue and in cultural activities and social cohesion with local communities. So this is the living embodiment of what the social economy can deliver and perform. We are following the COVID safe rules here. Everyone will be wearing a mask and be respecting the distance where possible. For those of you at home or in your offices watching, we welcome you and you are a strong part of our conversation. Please feel free to interact with us. So to set the scene and explain a little bit, what is this thing, the social economy? Why is it such a big deal? And why is it so exciting that we have an action plan? I'm delighted to in invite the first speaker to join me, and that's Nicolas Hazard, who is the founder and CEO of an organization called INCO. <laughs> and he's also an advisor to the European Commission on the Social Economy. Nicola. Tell us more about this action plan and why it's such a big deal. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you. I remember 10 years ago, I was uh, just getting out of school uh, from university and I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to build a venture that at the same time is creating a job, that is creating, a, uh, that is a real business. But at the same time, I wanted to change the world and I wanted to have a strong social and environmental impact on my community. And I remember 10 years ago, I met, I had the privilege to, make, to meet with Michel Barnier, that at that time launched the Social Business Initiative uh, to develop and to create a framework for the social economy in Europe. And I remember that time, I had the chance to meet with him, and he told me how important it is to uh, develop social enterprises. And he gave me the strength and the courage and the motivation to set up a social enterprise and to set up a social company and that's now INCO and we're in more than 60 countries operating and, and, and it's a big, uh, big success. So thanks to him as well. There's a new movement. Social economy is very important and for the last 10 years it has evolved a lot. It is uh, absolutely key uh, because social economy is uh, creating solution and are part of the solution to the major crisis that we're facing right now. The first one that we've just um, that, that that we're in the middle of right now and that we had like for the past two years is the of course the health crisis. This health crisis was a big one and showed how our economy and how our world can be uh, fragile. And remember who at the very beginning when we didn't have any surgical mask uh, who created and produced these social these masks who created and made these masks for the people that were uh, very vulnerable. Lots of them were social enterprises, whether they're non-profits, whether they're cooperatives or social entrepreneurs, they have been there during the crisis. It's the same for the food and for the food network supplies. All the short circuits that have been built, all this new economy to think the agriculture in a new way through cooperative, but also social enterprise, lots of them were made by social entrepreneurs. And of course, uh, our elderly, the elderly people, our retirement homes, our hospital, lots of them are run even right now by non-profit or by mutual organization or by social entrepreneurs and they're part of the social economy. So the social economy is first of all very resilient. 
Another big, big challenge that we're facing, and we're all aware about that, it's the environment and the globalization, the global warming that we have, and all the, all the, all the big, big challenges that we have in front of us. And once again, a social economy is not only about taking care of the most fragile people, it's also being innovative, and social innovation is absolutely key. In the environmental sector, circular economy has been invented by social entrepreneurs, by uh, the social economy in general, making w uh, the waste that we produced a resource for building a new economy. But the new economy that creates growth, that is able to become greener, and we know that the European Commission has launched the, um, the European Green Deal, and it's a good thing, but without the people, an economy that is unequal, unequal is not an economy that is sustainable in the long term. And that's why it's absolutely also key, uh, besides the, the environmental policies that we're launching, also to work with people and to develop an economy that works for people. And that's where also the social economy plays a key role. There are today millions of neat people, young people that are not in education, not in employment, not in training, and that, that, that need resources and that, and that try to get into the labor market right now and are facing real difficulties. These people are millions in Europe and lots of them uh, haven't been able to be uh, helped and supported by the local governments. Today, lots of foundations, lots of non-profits work with these need people, especially with through work integration social enterprise. These company that hires these long-term excluded people from the job market and help them build the future, create opportunities, give them skills, whether they're hard skills or soft skills, to succeed in their future. And once again, social economy is there because social economy is inclusive. And maybe the last crisis that I think is the most frightening to me, the most scary to me, and, I'm, uh, and I really think we should do someone, is the democratic crisis that we have in front of us. Today, uh, and there are lots of studies about that, people that are under 30 in Europe, in the US, and in lots of places in the world, but in Europe as well, think that it's not absolutely necessary to live in a democracy. And that's very, very scary, because lots of people think that maybe having an authoritarian regime could be also a solution. And lots of young people have lost the hope and don't cherish as we cherish our democracy and our democratic system. And that's a big threat for the future and we need to give a new hope and show how our democratic values are absolutely key for the world that we want to build for tomorrow. And therefore, there's only one solution for me. It's education, education and education. Education is the key. Uh, bringing an education to lots of the European citizens is absolutely fundamental. And once again, there are lots of people and actors of the social economy that are pushing that hard and are, that are trying to get education to a lot of people that uh, are, uh, haven't had the chance really uh, to uh, stay in the education system, that are dropouts, for, the, for example. And lots of the players are working, uh, lots of the players of the social economy are, are helping uh, this, this, this new generation. So for me, that's key. So you understand social economy is all about that. It's uh, the solution for the world that we want to build, a world that is inclusive, a world that is sustainable, a world where our values of democracy is in the center of it. And once again, I want to thank uh, all the commission for this action plan, uh, all the teams that have been working a lot, and all of you I know from the 27 countries that have been contributing, giving us ideas, uh, and really trying to spread the world, and you're the actors, and you're going to make the difference in each of your countries, so thanks a lot. I want to thank Commissioner Breton, of course, for pushing that, because it's not only about social, it's also about economy, that's key. And of course, my friend Nicolas Schmidt. Uh, that is more than just uh, a, a commissioner in charge of this issue, that is a real ally, that is a friend, that is part of the social economy family, that is pushing hard for that for the last years. So thanks to you, I just hope one thing is that in 10 years, we will remember that moment that there are gonna be, and there's gonna be young entrepreneurs that will come on stage and will say, oh, thanks for you for this moment, thanks for you, uh, to, to you for this action plan, because because it gave me the motivation, the energy to create a social enterprise and to develop stuff and to make Europe a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nicola, for explaining just how, how much a motivational moment can have an impact. And we're hoping, as you say, that today acts as a motivational moment to many of the people perhaps watching at home who are thinking maybe they'd like to try a little something. Maybe they want to change the world, as you said. And of course, COVID has been a moment that's forced a lot of people to rethink. Maybe there are people watching today who will be inspired to set up their own social enterprise. enterprise. So thank you very thank much. Very much let me now Let me invite, invite two, two commissioners who are here, 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 here to come and, come and join me on the stage. stage. And we're going, and we're going to hear from, from them why the, why the Social Economy, Economy Action Plan, Plan has been, has been created and what they hope delivered. it will deliver. So, so I'm, I'm delighted to introduce Commissioner, Commissioner Nicola, Nicola Schmidt and Commissioner Thierry Please come to join me on the stage. So welcome. Commissioner Schmidt, I'm going to ask you first. We heard from Nicola uh, just now that this isn't just another dossier for you. This is something close to your heart. This is a, a passion and an objective that you'd had for some time. So, so tell us, what is your personal connection to this? Why is it so important to you personally that Europe does something on the social economy? Well, first, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great moment, a great pleasure for me to be here, together with my friend Thierry, uh, and together with all friends. Well, I discovered, I must say, discovered the social economy, well, uh, about seven years ago. I became a minister of social economy, and uh, not, I, I'm very, very open, not knowing exactly what it meant. And I remember my first meeting in Italy, and an Italian presidency, I noticed that this was an incredible force. And there, there was really a strong motivation among all the people who were, are engaged in social economy. And so uh, briefly after I met uh, Nicolas in Paris, at Pacto Carré, and we decided, I remember very well, to do something during the Luxembourgish presidency. And we started to do something on the Luxembourgish, during the Luxembourgish presidency with a lot of stakeholders, uh, uh, getting a, a, council, uh, a council conclusions on social economy. This was a few years after Barnier had... Very sorry. Um, I'm a, a loud voice. Uh, um, so uh, after Barnier had launched the social business initiative. So uh, we uh, developed that. And finally, to, to cut a, a long story short, when I uh, had my meeting with the president of the commission, I said, well, I would very much like to work on social economy too. And she said, okay, I, I will see, could you give me a short note on social economy? And finally, I found then in my mission letter, the idea of this action plan. And together with Thierry, together with a lot of people in the, in the DGs, in the commission, uh, we made it with your help, with the social economy network, which is a large network, a very creative and innovative network, we made it. Thank you, so, so for you, for you, it went from a job description to something that you, you lobbied to have it in your mandate. So now that we've got this brand new document and everyone has a chance to, to look at it and download it, what is the action plan and why do we need it? Well, what is the action plan? It's a plan which uh, gives us uh, guidance, ideas, uh, policies, and uh, which invites us to act, because an action plan is an invitation for action. And uh, I think this is now uh, on the table of the Commission. It's on the table of uh, member states. Uh, and we have now to make sure that uh, this plan is transformed into concrete actions. And there are a lot of ideas in this action plan, but they uh, can only live if we give them life, if we uh, start this action, and uh, I think uh, there is a lot of motivation to do so. And I think what changes with that, this is, uh, in my view, and therefore I'm very happy that Thierry joined us, 
that, and he did it even before the action plan was, was finished. He decided to make out of social economy an ecosystem, an economic ecosystem among the 14 ecosystems he I'd identified. And I think that was a very strong political signal. And now, together with that, together with all these millions of people involved in social economy, building up this economy, which I consider also an, an economy with an old history, but remaining a new economy in a way, uh, I think we can achieve a lot uh, uh, in, in, in our society and in, in the economy at large, because what happens in the social economy will also inspire uh, other enterprises and is about already to inspire other enterprises. Thank you. Let me now turn to uh, Commissioner Breton. What's your perspective on the action plan coming at it very much from an economic perspective and how can the transition pathway help deliver some of these changes? Well, first, uh, first, uh, maybe yeah. I take, um, okay. First, first, I would like to, uh, to thank you very much for inviting me and and if you allow me, I really would like to thank my friend Nicola, because he's the one. Uh, <laughs> and, and he has been lucky because uh, he was a commissioner before me. I became a commissioner completely par hasard. <laughs> it was not his case. So when he joined, he was able to negotiate everything. When I came, I was a plan B, so I had nothing to choose. I had just to take, but I discovered that in what I got, we had, of course, the capacity in the internal market to reorganize our internal market uh, with uh, ecosystems. And that's true that I decided, of course, after discussing a lot with Nicola, that the social economy is so important. Of course, if I just look at figures, it's important in terms of GDP. More than 10% of our European GDP, so <laughs> that's really something important for the Commissioner for Internal Markets at HAM. Important also, for, by the way, for some countries, it's 15% even. It's important in terms of jobs, 13.6 million and growing. So, of course, uh, I decided immediately after talking to Nicola, we have to create an ecosystem in social economy and just follow it help this ecosystem not only to be part of it, but to transform itself through the whole transformation and transition that we are going through. And, uh, and by the way, as you know, uh, we have all the other ecosystems, automotive industry, uh, could be a retail, uh, could be tourism. So that's a very important ecosystem. So it means that a very important part, you are a very important part of what we do. That's the first thing. But of course, uh, we are all uh, in, um, in, 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 in a transition mode, like you said it, Nicola, uh, because of the crisis. Uh, by the way, I would like to say that during the crisis, I would like to, uh, to pay my tribute to the social economy sector because you did, you were on the front line. And by the way, it's, it's a job, most of the job of this uh, the social economy is to be front line, to be close to others, to be close to people, to be here when others are not here. Um, comme on dit en français, de tricoter des liens. Il y en a qui tricotent des, des chaussettes, des éléphants, des pulls verts. Il y en a qui tricotent des liens. Et vous, vous tricotez des liens uh, 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 within, within the society. By the way, that's why it's pretty smart. Hein? Yeah. Uh, no, no, but it's pretty smart. Uh, nothing is done by hazard, I know. Uh, uh, nothing at all. Uh, and, and, but, but, but this being said, I mean, the social economy is playing such an important role and in this consideration, it's extremely modern because this is what we need. We learn it during the crisis more than ever. By the way, thank you for everything which has been done, including when I was in charge of the uh, PPE. Huh? These things, they were frontline doing night, days and night to make sure that our uh, health uh, personnel will be able to be um, fully protected where we are missing for this equipment. But, but, but this, uh, this being said, um, uh, when, when we look at what we had of, had of us, and we spend a lot of time, Nicola and myself, um, to work on the transition, 
let's say, the triple transition. Of course, the green, the green deal, and social economy will play an extremely important role here. Being against the, the last mile. Um, the digital transition. We, Nicola, that's a big project for both of us. We need to make sure that social economy will also benefit, will also be part of it, will also be in the front uh, line on the digital transition. And we know that for some of them, we need to be here. We need to give them also the trainings. We need to reskill. We need to offer them opportunities. And then, of course, we have the resilient. And I think it is very, it's, uh, the, the third transition. And I think it's a very also resilient. It makes us stronger. And the last point I would like to say is that um, um, two things, if you, if you allow me. The first one is that I said it's modern. It's modern also because a lot of the young generation, uh, Nicola, they love to work for something. They love a purpose. And this is what we offer here. So that's a model. It embeds all our values, all our European values, and it's a fantastic opportunity also um, for um, more and more of the new generation to do a job with, with a purpose and to be part of the society to be part of our cohesion, to be part of our European project, because our values are strongly embedded here. Uh, and that's something that uh, is extremely important. The, the, and the last thing I would like to say, maybe it's, it will open some questions, is that I said it's modern. It's modern also because we are pushing extremely hard now, and that's in the resilience part, um, circular economy. And we see here, a lot of needs and opportunity. Um, because this is something which should, should be close uh, to uh, the people, close to the product, uh, reusing products, uh, following also uh, the life cycle of a, of a product. So that's a l very probably potentially important uh, reserve of uh, jobs, activities, but here also Nicola we need to make sure that the skills will be here. And this is why we have decided, Nicola and myself, to have this transition pathway also for the 13 million, almost 14 million women and men working in this very important field. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Nicola, may maybe you could just give us a, a, a little bit of context. What are the actions that are in the action plan and how would this change for people on the ground? We've, we've heard about the energy, we've heard about the dynamism, we've heard about the purpose, the, the knitting together of connections between people that the social economy uh, delivers. What's in this action plan that will make a difference to the people who are either in it or interested in going into the social economy? Well, I, I think the first uh, achievement is that there is a strong recognition of social economy now at European level. That was a first try by uh, Barnier, uh, Commissioner Barnier, but now we have an action plan, we have uh, something very concrete, very solid, uh, and there is a strong commitment by the Commission uh, for this ecosystem called social economy. This is important because this takes this economy, which is a very important one in terms of uh, GDP contribution in terms of jobs out of a corner where uh, it has stayed in some way. And it's now part of the whole economic picture of Europe. So this is a, a first element which is important. And this means also that European policies will fully apply, will fully include social economy. So when we are talking about technology, when we are talking about the, the Green Deal and climate change, uh, when we are talking about money, uh, also the uh, RRF, well, social economy it can be an equal partner in, this, uh, in all these uh, dimensions. So this is recognition, visibility, uh, which should also be a motivation for all those active in this uh, social economy sector. Second one, 
Certainly, it's more targeted. We have to see how can we really support social economy in its development, in its scaling up, because very often social economy develop, but then there is some kind of a ceiling uh, uh, which they cannot uh, just uh, uh, pass over. And here, I think it's important that uh, the European dimension, the internal market, is there. Why should the social economy uh, entity, be it an enterprise or an association, not be take advantage of the internal market? Uh, and this is important. But to do that, we need also to bring some kind of uh, recognition into the diversity. Because when we are talking about social economy at the European level, well, there is not one size fits all. There is a big diversity which has grown through the history, the practices, uh, the uh, personal and social uh, commitments, organizations, uh, civil society, and so on. So diversity is part of the social economy at European level. And uh, I think nobody wants to change this diversity because this is also something if, uh, which makes this sector so rich. But we have to bring in the possibility to recognize uh, each other's system. Uh, there are criteria, there are values, and the commissioner has mentioned, uh, Thierry has mentioned the importance of values. There's a way how entities, be it enterprises or whatever, our cooperatives are managed. So we need to have some kind of a mutual recognition. And that's something we will still work on it. That does not mean we will now have one uh, European harmonized system, how uh, a social economy should work. No, I think we have to find a certain number of points which allow in one country to, uh, to be recognized if I come from another member state. So this is some kind of a level, creating a level playing field for social uh, enterprises or social uh, economy entities. So this is something we will work on together with the sector all over the 27 member states. We uh, have announced that we will come up with a new recommendation next year which bring up these ideas and will help member states also to uh, evaluate what is finally uh, uh, the, the main features of a social uh, enterprise. And then we have a lot of issues like state aid, like finance. Finance is key. And here also we, we see that for social economy <coughs> entities very often they have difficulties to, fight, to find the right finance uh, because banks are a bit reluctant. Now perhaps they will be less reluctant because they have now, they notice, well, social economy entities are recognized. They uh, have now gained some kind of European status. The Europe is uh, really recognizing social economy. So this is also important for the financial issue. And uh, here we, we have still to work. I said, it's an action plan. Now we have to put life into the action plan. We will do it in the commission. We have to do it with you. We have to do it with member states, local authorities, wherever there are social entities, we, we will be there and help and discuss and create. Thank you very much. And I'm going to invite to give a, a reaction, Martin Sandbu from the Financial Times. And just while he's doing that, I'm inviting you, if you've got a question you'd like to put to the commissioners, to use Slido. And as a reminder, you go to slido.com, and the code you need to put in is SEAP2021. If you have questions that I can put to the two commissioners, and I see a couple have come in, but Martin, let me just come to you. I, I, I noticed you nodding when the commissioners were talking about the size of the sector, its flexibility, how quickly it responded to urgent needs, this, uh, this special role of knitting together connections between people. We've heard about the demographic, the democratic crisis, the green transition. It sounds a little bit like the social economy is the magic source. What's your view, Martin? Thank you, Tamsin, and, and thanks, uh, Commissioner Smith and Breton. You can hear me, I hope. Yes, we can. It's always, it's always a hazard of digital connections, and I am sorry I can't join you in person, but it's a pleasure to be with you uh, virtually. Look, I, I get a bit of a sort of sweep of history sense here, because it occurs to me that, uh, like Commissioner Schmidt, I'm sort of discovering the social economy uh, recently, but of course it's not a new thing. Uh, 
some of the oldest social enterprises, social enterprises or types, that sort of, of entity is much older than the more common form of corporate organization we have today, the joint stock uh, corporation. The social economy and social enterprises have their roots in, uh, in medieval Europe, in particular in finance, to do insurance purposes, mutual aid, even the early banks and indeed many of the existing banks are foundation banks uh, or otherwise not-for-profit uh, banks. Uh, so this is something very old uh, in Europe. If we're discovering it now, it's really that we're rediscovering something that's very deeply European. Uh, but as Commissioner Breton said, it's also something of the future. It's something modern. Uh, and I think of social enterprises and the so social economy as often being pioneers or, or laboratories for ways of running economic transactions, economic activities uh, that we need and that aren't done uh, by the for-profit part of the economy. Uh, a couple of examples. One is uh, labor inclusion, which uh, the Commission mentions in the action plan. Uh, it's very often social enterprises on the ground that manage to bring in people who run the margins of the labor market uh, and give them worthwhile uh, work. Uh, that is something we know in Europe we need. It's good for the economy, including the for-profit economy, to increase labor force participation. Uh, another example is local economic integration. When something is created and, and made profitable at a, in a local area, how does that uh, money keep circulating to create more activity locally rather than being pulled out? And this is something every European country has a problem with when we see rises in regional inequality, some regions being left behind, and so on. Just another example I like very much, um, the sharing economy started uh, in the social, social uh, economy. And before we had Airbnb and before we had Zipcar and so on, people were figuring out, would it be nice if we could share some of the things we have in neighborhoods, uh, locally in particular. And I think that last example shows something very important, which is that it's, it's insufficient to think of the social economy and social enterprises as being the kind of altruistic, nice, cuddly margin of the big economy. It, it is that. It is more humane, perhaps. It has other purposes than profit. It uh, uh, like uh, Commissioner Breton said. But it's also about the smart use of economic resources. The sharing economy is about using objects and resources more efficiently and effectively. And that's indeed why you do get then for profit giants, you get Airbnb and so on, picking it up and running with it. So you know, all of this makes me think that we are rediscovering here something that's very much in the European DNA, which is the social market economy more generally. And the idea here is that the social isn't a sort of nice add-on to the market economy. The social is itself productive. Uh, and, and a spur to effectiveness and efficiency and innovation. Um, you know, I, I could go on. I'm not going to go for more examples. I'll just point out a couple of challenges, and, and I'm glad to see in the action plan that these are noted. Uh, because given what I just said, uh, even as social enterprise does a lot of amazing work very locally at the kind of micro level where the, the big economy, as it were, doesn't kind, kind of arrive, uh, we shouldn't think of it as only that. We should also think of the social economy at scale. Social enterprises could be big. Some charities are very big. Um, and I think for that, we need to think about how can the social economy scale up. So just two, two opportunities or challenges, depending on whether you're a glass half full, glass half empty person. Um, these are mentioned in the action plan. One is how do we facilitate cross-border social economic activity. Commissioner Schmidt was talking about this. Um, and how do we ensure that governments use their policies to let the social economy thrive? And something that struck me in, uh, in the Commission's documents as the, the plans were launched today that, uh, was, was a remark that national governments are not really using all the leeway in the state aid rules or in public procurement rules to channel public funds to, to social enterprises. So I think, you know, partly the fact that the Commission is aware of this and will work on this is a good thing. And I think some of it will come with a change in mentality that sees the social economy not just as a, a soft-hearted thing, which is a good thing, but a hard-headed thing. The social economy delivers services that we need. 
They deliver products that we need. They deliver innovation, particularly digital innovation that we need. And governments should avail themselves of that. I will finish there. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating project. I'm, I'm learning as I'm participating. Uh, but I wish you all very good luck. And of course, to everyone uh, who's participating online or in the audience who are actually at the coalface of this, very good luck to you all. Thank you very much. And before we go to the next session, I'd like to ask each commissioner one question that's come from the audience. Uh, perhaps the question from Toby I would ask you, to, uh, Nicola, to respond to, which is, what actions can the EC take to encourage environmental and social impacts to be considered by all enterprises? So it isn't the, just the social enterprises who take that into account. Uh, and Thierry, we had a question um, that's not up there at the moment, but it was essentially saying, what's Europe doing directly to encourage the social economy to participate in the internal market, you know, maybe direct procurement. How can the EU money and the way that it's being spent prioritize and encourage space for the social economy? So let me start with you, Nicola. Let's ask, how do we get mainstream yeah. business to do some of the good stuff that social yeah. economy does? I think, first, the example that social economy can work can be successful. That's the first point. The second one, and Thierry has mentioned it, we are in a time where uh, finally, values are important, especially for young people. Uh, purpose is important. And we see in the world of uh, the so-called market economy or uh, that the idea is that finally we need a bit more than just profit making. And uh, the quarter st <coughs> stock exchange value. Uh, this is uh, something which uh, starts to be more and more developed. And I think there can be interactions between social economy growing, scaling up, and companies, corporations. And this also gives uh, companies the, pur the, the purpose. And now we are working, uh, and Thierry with uh, uh, our friend uh, uh, Didier Reinders, on uh, due diligence and also what are the uh, uh, finally uh, objective, non-financial objectives of a company. Uh, because we cannot just uh, close our eyes and say companies are not part of the Green Deal. No, without companies, there is no Green Deal. So, environmental dimension. We have seen now that social is key, not just uh, because we have to have it. No, it's key also for the stability of our companies, for the stability of our societies. And here I think there is an interaction uh, with social economy and uh, a debate on what are the purposes of companies? They cannot just be limited to financial results. They have to be open uh, and uh, go into this direction. And that's what, uh, by the way, this commission is also working on. Thank you, Thierry. If I could invite you to perhaps reflect on how the EU can use public procurement and the way the EU funds are spent to try and encourage and create space for the social economy. One of the great challenges of a tendering is it's designed to get the best value for money, which tends to be seen as the cheapest. And social economy doesn't always fit into that. So how can you adjust the, the mindset to see the social economy take a bigger role? I will be very short in your answer because I see that uh, we have uh, Madame Mohamed Yumus uh, uh, who is here with us here. I see him on the screen. Mohamed, hello. Uh, he's, he's, hello. He's, he's really, he's, if there is somebody who should be here today, it's him together with Nicola, of course, but it's him. And I remember the discussion we had in Paris with, uh, with Laurent Lafont uh, a few years ago on, on, on this subject with, uh, with, with uh, uh, Professor Yum. So I will not be long because he's the one. But still, there's a few things. First, in the document, we have already some ideas. So I think it's important we put this already uh, together with, uh, with, with Nicola. So we have, we, have, we have a trend. But I would like to, 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 to tell you that we are here today, and it means that not only you are extremely important, but you are all recognized. So now, it's your call. Be vocal. Go to see your member states. They have the money. Because, no, no, but it's serious. We, we have been very cautious, together with Nicola, to make sure that member states, in their recovery plans, will have envelopes 
to accompany the transition green, digital, and resilience. And in these three categories, you are eligible. But of course, and that's the second thing, we need projects, and the member states need projects, and you have the projects. So move, let's go. You have projects for the green transition, go. You have projects, and you need skills for the digital, go. And by the way, for the resilience part, and especially in circular economy, by the way, this is an area where we need a lot of digital skills, when, when we look at the blockchain that we will use now to come to, or, the, the, or the, the certificate that we will have in a lot of product now, digital certificates, to make sure that everybody will be able to use again the, uh, everything that we want for the uh, circular economy, not only in your city, not only in your region, not only in your country, but in the whole EU. So that's another, another a, a fantastic opportunity. So the money is here, let's do it. And time is the sense, because we were pushing member states to make sure that they have two years now to move. So that's a very good news for you. And we'll make sure with Nicola that uh, when you will have projects, when member states will come, you will get the money. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, commissioners. <laughs> Thank you for that. And also for all the questions that you submitted from the audience. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker. You've been given a, a little foretaste. Our next speaker is an economist, nothing unusual on that. A banker, again, nothing unusual in that. But he is also, and perhaps most proud of being a social entrepreneur. And as a result of that, he's also a Nobel Peace Prize winner. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to everyone, Professor Mohammed Yunus. Welcome to the launch event for Thank the you. Social Economy Action Plan. Now, of course, you are absolutely well known for creating a, a wide understanding about the social economy, but your work challenges traditional economic orthodoxy on motivation and self-interest. Why hasn't there been enough attention to the very powerful concept of the collective interest? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, let me respond to your question. Uh, I have been saying that... Uh, uh, traditional economics are forgotten about the collective interest. So they assumed human being someone driven by uh, self-interest only. Uh, so self-interest in economics is translated as profit maximization. Because it assumed that way, they created the whole economy around that idea. That what the individual should be doing, be pursuing that one goal, profit maximization. In the process, what has happened, we became uh, profit-maximizing robots, money-making robots. We don't have any human quality left in, in us because economists squeezed it out. Uh, so we did only become uh, focused on uh, profit maximization. That became our addiction. That's what continued to pursue. That's what the traditional businesses do. Uh, what happened to the collective interest? Is a human being a ba basically is a driven by self-interest as well as collective interest. So what happened to the collective interest? A traditional economists said, well, leave it to the government. Government should take care of the collective interest, whatever collective problems they have, uh, society has to be, give, to be left to the government to solve it. Individuals have no responsibility whatsoever. So they can do all, all the things that need to do just to make profit maximization. In the process, we created a world with global warming because uh, individual businesses don't care about uh, global warming. It should, uh, should be left to the government and government has no clue how to handle global warming. And they help, look, helplessly look at the businesses, what they can do. And also wealth concentration because we have profit maximization is the core of the business. So we created profit maximization. We created all the problems of unemployment and everything that we do right now. So this is what you asked, what happened to the collective interest? Collective interest is left to the government and government has no way handled it, a huge task. Because in the meantime, businesses which created, keep creating the problems, major problems like global warming and other things that we have. Thank you for that. Perhaps we could talk a little bit about the impact of the pandemic and particularly on inequalities, because in an unequal world, the impact of the pandemic has also been unequal. The rich got richer 
and a decade of progress on poverty reduction, on gender empowerment, and other social progress has been lost. But the pandemic's also a transformation event. Now, there's a lot of pressure to restart economic activities, which has sort of been seen as business as usual. How do you think we could reuse this moment to reposition business at the service of society? Yes, I'm appealing to the world that uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been a terrible thing for the whole world, but it's also done something uh, very welcome. Uh, created an opportunity for us to redesign the economic machine that we are running uh, for the, all these years. So this is a good time to redesign that machine so that we, can, we don't go back to the same old way of doing things. I, I keep saying that we, before the pandemic, we are sort of a, riding a train, a fast train, or the whole world is riding the train. It's going at a very high speed uh, to the direction but it's a suicidal direction. Uh, the, all the economy is doing is taking us to the last station and which are all the reports from the scientists telling us we don't have much time left on the planet anymore. Uh, we, are, we are at the moment uh, most endangered species on this planet uh, because of the way global warming is happening, it's continue to uh, rise. And we are, we are told that uh, the IPCC report, there's only about a decade left uh, before we reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius, unless we do something drastic in the meantime. So uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, global temperature is a kind of end of our uh, way of surviving on this planet. And we, after that, we enter the red zone. So this is the direction the train was taking. What pandemic has done, stop the train, because the economic machine doesn't work anymore. It's slowed down, it stopped in many ways. And it's, now it's a time for us to decide whether when we restart, the, we will restart the engine and get back to the train, or we create a new engine and a new train go in a different direction. So I keep saying, uh, right decision right now would be no going back. We don't want to go back to the pre-pandemic situation because if, if we do that, we are only counting our days when it will be all over. Rather, we should. This is a good time to redirect our uh, energy and capacity to go in a different direction and create a new world, not a world of global warming, but it will be zero net carbon emission world, uh, zero global warming situation. Not only zero global warming, there are other issues which is making the current situation, current economic system uh, make us vulnerable, wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is concentrated in a few hands. You asked that question, even in the pandemic period, you, uh, you have, you have, we have been told again and again, just with the start of the pandemic, millions of people lost their job, lost their life, pushed down the poverty line wherever they were, even those who just got above the poverty line, they are pushed back again. Uh, and it will take again years to get them back above the poverty line. So what is so important about the poverty line? It's in, important because if you look at the wealth distribution of the planet. All the wealth of the world is in the super, super higher height of the income, uh, sorry, wealth uh, map. Uh, only 1% or a small percentage of the total wealth is at the bottom. So the wealth is in the top. All the few lucky people own that wealth. 99% of the wealth is owned by 1% of the population of the entire world. So 99% of the population are at the bottom of this wealth map with leaving with 1% of the wealth. So when pandemic came, they are pushed down, further down. They were already down, they're way behind, we're way down on the uh, map, but they're pushed down. In the same period of the pandemic, uh, few people who were uh, on the top of the world and the uh, wealth map, they have accumulated more than $11 trillion during this period. So the wealthy are becoming wealthy are becoming more wealthy. Uh, people who are at the bottom are getting dust, and this is this is a constant phenomenon. Only thing happened in during the pandemic is they're pushed suddenly further down. But usually, when we say they are coming out of the uh, out of the uh, poverty line, it's moving up. We great success is happening. Yes, success is happening, but they are still close to the poverty line. They didn't go very far from there. 
If you look at the $2.50 people, they are at the poverty line itself. And if you $3 people, $5 people, $100 people, they are very close to the poverty line, not very far away from the poverty line. But the only thing is, even whatever gain they have made, they, they inched a little bit, but by that time, the super rich got to miles away with the wealth people. So this is what we have to recognize, and we don't want to go back to that economy, which makes this happen, continuously pushing wealth all the way to the up. So we need to design a new machine to take us to a new direction. And I, I give the new direction of where we want to go. It should be a world of three zeros. We should be creating a world of three zeros. Zero net carbon emission, zero wealth concentration, and zero unemployment by unleashing the energy and the creativity of the people to become entrepreneurs. So that is the direction we should be going, not in the direction that we are coming from. So this is a good opportunity that pandemic has created for us, and we should seize this opportunity. Thank you very much. I'm intrigued by this vision of the, the train that we're on that was uh, creating growing inequalities and was taking us to the station at the end of the line. As you said, we don't have long. Um, recently at an event, the Food and Agriculture Organization said we have eight harvests left till 2030. Look at that. You mentioned we've got, you know, we've got eight, ten years left to save 1.5 1 degrees warming, which is the difference between life and death for people in many countries, Absolutely. including uh, in, in Bangladesh, where you are, which will be dreadfully affected by this. So this, this yes. engine that we've got to create, and you've talked about the triple zeros. Now, I think people are very familiar with the term of going for net zero in terms of carbon, but you've also linked that just now into zero poverty and zero unemployment. It sounds like those are three different trains. Is it possible, in your view, to achieve all three at the same time? Uh, it's absolutely, it's the same thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something is the outcome of the present economic system. So they are not coming from three different sources. Source is the same. If you want me to say in one word, what is the source is? The source is profit maximization. So everything is happening because of the profit maximization. Profit maximization is creating the world, unlivable world because of the global warming. And this, you see, very soon you'll be noticing uh, during this discussion, wherever you are having global warming discussion, and you mentioned Bangladesh, global warming is making this world into two different worlds. One is a livable part of the world, and it's the, another part is unlivable part of the world. So unlivable part of the world, like this, for example, all these island countries, which will disappear, islands will disappear, and the people have to go to some place where they will be safe. So they will be rushing to the places where they will go for the livable part of the planet. And as those days go by, the livable part will become smaller and smaller, unlivable part will become bigger and bigger. And then it will be small, so small that 8 billion people on this planet has to hold this small, tiny area, which is still livable and is still getting squeezed and squeezed further and further and so on. And that will be tremendous tension, the confrontation among people, among the nations to save their people, say, push them. And this is not a usual migration thing we are talking about. Migration is for better life. They want to improve their life. This is for desperation of saving their life. It's not about improving their life. Simply hold on to their life, their children, their families, and so on. This would be a terrible, terrible thing that is happening the global warming. So the global warming is happening because of the, our companies are creating it, as, as simple as that. And why they are creating it? Because they are asked by the, they are told by the economies that you don't have to worry about the collective interest, you worry about your self-interest. Your only goal you have is to profit maximization. So you sell as much fossil fuel as you want, no problem, because you want to make money. And that's what the companies are doing. So you don't blame them because that's what the hospitals want. And that's what the government wants to do, create jobs for people and so on, and money and pay taxes. But in the process, they are destroying the world. So unless we remove this idea of profit maximization and come out of this civilization, profit-centric civilization, we have to get rid of this profit-centric civilization to go to a new civilization. And that's what the three zero world is all about create a new civilization, which is not based in profit maximization. That's based on sharing of wealth, not monopolizing the wealth. There's a 
creating the planet as a safe planet, handing over the planet to a new generation, to the much safer planet than we inherited from our uh, previous generation and so on. So that's the direction we have to go. That's where we talk about the social business. Social business is a business not to make money, but to solve people's problems. That's a collective interest part. So that collective interest part has to be now brought in and to redesign the new economic system. And we are talking about creating jobs. I said job is a wrong idea. It's created by the economists to make sure wealth concentration can continue. I said human beings are born as entrepreneurs. All we have to do is to make sure our financial system is de designed the right way so that all people can become entrepreneurs. I said the finance is the oxygen of entrepreneurship. If you cannot provide that oxygen, people will remain uh, idle. They don't know what to do with themselves. Then you offer them the job. Job is a kind of a slavery to take orders from other people and do things because you cannot do any other thing for your survival. So if you, if you go back to the financial system, open the door for the financial system to make it available to anybody who wants to create a business for themselves, they will become entrepreneurs. And entrepreneur, the moment you bring this oxygen to the people, they become entrepreneurs. And that's what the microcredit, you heard about microcredit, that we have been running this microcredit all around the world, all over Bangladesh. Tiny little loans to the poor women, illiterate poor women, suddenly she becomes an entrepreneur. She starts a business, she pays back the loan with interest and their sustainable business and so on. And so business is run as a social business, not to make money for the the owners of the business, just to solve the problem of the people. So we need to create social business banking system. Today, banking system is to make money. They want to make money. Even the pharmaceutical company uh, gives us a, a problem of making money for themselves so that people can die. You can share less. Millions of people can die, but uh, they want to maximize their profit. So we need to create social business pharmaceutical company. We will be creating this pharmaceutical company to provide vaccines and medicine at a fair cost, near, near to the cost of production and so on. So we have to redesign the economic system so that we can create that world. So that's the fundamental thing, profit maximization, which created all these problems. Basic core problem is that. So once we resolve that, all these issues of global warming, wealth concentration, massive unemployment, by bringing artificial intelligence, all this will be over. Thank you. Let me just pick, on, pick up on what you were talking about there, because you, you highlighted the, the origins of your story as a social uh, entrepreneur was around the Grameen Bank and small micro loans to, to illiterate women to give them a chance to you know, grow and to do something. So perhaps let's talk a little bit about the question of scale. We heard from the commissioners that at the moment the social economy is 10% of our GDP and it employs about 13 million. But the commissioner's view is that it, it could take up a much larger part of our economy. But I think the mindset around social economy is it tends to be seen as one of these things at the edges of our economy. It's the nice to have. It's some kind of humanitarian activity for people who don't fit into the labor market. And it isn't seen as the central driver of growth and jobs and opportunity. Um, how you, You've highlighted that the reason that we were on the, the train to destruction to the last station was a view as, as human beings are, as robots for profit and um, profit maximization. How do we bring some of the, the ethos of the social economy in? And how realistic is it that it can be the kinds of big unicorn companies that we're looking for, especially as Europe is facing a big hit economically as a result of the pandemic? The, the search will be big scale change, big scale jobs. Can the social economy act at scale? Yeah. Uh, let me give the two examples quickly. Uh, one is the pharmaceutical company that I was talking about. And now the pharmaceutical companies defending themselves that we spend a lot of money in research and things and uh, to develop this vaccine. So we have to recover all this money and make profit. Profit is the incentive. So unless you give us the profit, we'll not have the incentive to do it more and so on. My response to that, I said, most of these vaccines are designed, defined by the laboratories where governments pour in huge money invested huge money to, to come up with this uh, vaccine formulas and so on, recipe for the formula. And now governments are not getting all this profit out of them. 
So if government has invested so much money in designing it, why is the government keeping shut? Keep the mouth shut to say, why don't you keep it available uh, to everybody to remove the uh, patent? We, we are not giving you public money, taxpayers money to protect it only for yourself. So my question is, why doesn't the government, instead of giving this money to the profit maximizing companies, help invest in creating social business pharmaceutical company. The moment this money comes to the social business pharmaceutical company, this money goes to the social business research laboratories, they will be creating it and it will be public property. It will be available to anybody who will pay the price at the, at the cost price and so on. It will be no restriction. It will be shared by everybody else. So it's a question of government decisions, legal issues, not about not available, people not being available to do that. So this is one, it's already being done, but the money goes to the only the profit makers. They, they are not pay, put, getting you, giving you back. Why doesn't government create a social business fund so that anybody who wants to create social business can take the money from the social business fund and start the social businesses to do that? And now coming to the microfinance. Microfinance work as a social business in Bangladesh. It's all over Bangladesh. Grameen Bank alone has more than 9 million borrowers. 97% of them are women. We have been running it for nine, the last 40, 44 years. Still, it's the payment record has become uh, remained as 97% and above. Nobody said it cannot be done. It's get done. It's, a, it's, it's an economy which helps millions of people to get out of the poverty and so on. That's why microcredit became known. That's why microcredit was given Nobel Peace Prize. But what happened to the banking system? Banking system remain the same way. They want to give the money to the uh, rich people. They want to give trillions of dollars to the fossil fuel industry, not to the poor people. Why? Poor people cannot pay back. Poor people cannot give you the return to make uh, cover all your costs. They do, but fossil fuel money will be much more attractive to you because they give you more profit. So profit maximization takes you to the fossil fuel industry. Profit maximization takes you to of uh, plastic industry. Uh, so you're investing in that. And in the process, you're destroying the planet. Here, if you had done it on the other way, create a social business fund and invested in creating microcredit in, uh, in institutions like Grameen Bank to save millions and millions of people during this pandemic who lost their jobs, they will become entrepreneurs. They will grow and continue to grow. And all the young people around the world grow up knowing that they can start their business and retain their business and continue. And the idea of social, uh, the idea of microfinance has spread all over the world. It's not a Bangladeshi phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. We run even microcredit program in the United States. I give the example of the United States because it's the richest country in the world. We have uh, now uh, 27 branches in 17 cities of New York, uh, 17 cities of the US, United States, in New York, uh, Boston, Houston, Chicago, and many others, uh, 17 cities. We have over 160,000 borrowers, 100% women, and give loans just like a Grameen Bank does in Bangladesh, without any collateral, without any identity, uh, and the repayment rate is about 99% and, uh, and above. Uh, and people are, but it's not a, it's, you, we, we don't get a banking license because we don't qualify to have a banking license. That's the key. Government is the res creating all these walls because you're not giving us a license, because you say you don't fit into the banking law. To create a new law, if you don't, create, you don't fit into the banking law, banking law was created to create bank for the rich and make money out of them. So that doesn't fit uh, to create bank for the poor. Bank for the poor needs to be done in a different way, like we do. We, create, we created the bank, which uh, is not uh, asking for any collateral. It's a collateral free banking. It's a lawyer-free banking. We don't have any lawyer in our system. Uh, people say, oh, it's impossible. We, see, we have been doing it for four years. What is impossible? It's all over the world right now. So why don't you create a new law to create bank for the poor? All we need, the, the moment we have the law, the moment you can create the bank for the poor, then we can take deposits. You see, today, most of the microfinance organizations are run by NGOs. That's why they uh, suffer. They cannot grow because donors have to give the money. They cannot take deposits from the market. If you can take the deposit from the market, money is not a problem, but law doesn't allow it. So I go back to the government to take action, create microfinance banks, to create social business microfinance bank, create legal framework to do that. It's a, most of the time is a legal framework because legal framework is based 
on the theories of economics that was promoted uh, to make, maximize profit. They didn't think about solving people's problem. The moment it's a creation of people's problem come, the law become a obst obstacle. So we need to address those legal issues to make it happen. Thank you. And if I could ask one last question, you know, what advice Go ahead. would you give to the European Union and member states? You've already mentioned there is make sure that the legal framework is supportive Absolutely. of the philosophy of the social economy sector and al allow them to have the financing they need. But if, if you had advice and um, here in, in Europe, sure. we're coming towards the Christmas period and my kids write a letter to Santa to say what gifts they would like. Yeah. If you were going to be writing a letter to the European Union and its member states on the gifts it could give to the social economy sector this Christmas, what advice would you be giving? One is create a, a big uh, social business venture capital fund so that anybody who wants to start their own business for the first time as an individual person uh, any unemployed person, any half-employed person, or whoever, or somebody who out of curiosity wants to create a business, a social business particularly, but any kind of business, even money-making business, that doesn't matter. This fund will be available to them so that they can do this a business proposition, not a charity proposition. They will be responsible to return the money so that they can get more chunk of money in the subsequent tranches and so on and they grow their business. This is the... Finance is the key. I would say the most important thing you can do, pay attention to the laws governing the financial system and make sure social business, banks, social business, financial system can be created by changing the law. We are not asking for money. Simply remove the barrier. That's, a fun, that's the only way. People have the ability to do it. People are willing to do it but the law doesn't allow to do that. So one is the creation of a fund, social business venture capital fund, and every country can have a social business venture capital fund within the European Union. And they can do this same thing when they are doing the foreign aid, put their money in their respective uh, receiving countries uh, to create social business venture capital fund. And instead of donating this money, instead of giving away this money, create a fund so that people can take this money and turn themselves into entrepreneurs and solve the problem of the country, of the neighborhood, of the people who are there so that this becomes a business proposition rather than a charity proposition. Excellent, thank you very much. And I'd like to say a warm thank you to you, Professor Yunus. I know it's very late thank in the you. evening where you are, so thank you for staying up to spend some time thank with you. us and, and sharing thank your you insights. It was, it was a real privilege to have a chance to talk to you, and I'm sure the audience shares that experience as well. You were a visionary well before people had come up with the term for a social economy, and you're still giving us lessons about how we need to reframe our concepts and our views of where we're going in this world. And I sincerely hope that we're able to do, as you said, to get off the train going to the last station and to build a completely Absolutely. new economy and direction. No going back. No going back. Thank you very much, Professor Yunus. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So now we're going to take a short break. Uh, for those of you who are going to be watching us online, you have a chance to go and get yourself your coffee, your water, and move around. For the audience here in the room, outside you'll find uh, coffee machines. Please remember you need to keep your masks on unless you're seated. And go downstairs, there are tables, and we're going to aerate this room, and we will start again at 4.15. Thank you. Environmental goals guide economic activity. Social economy organizations are active in almost all sectors. Organizations include cooperatives, associations, mutual benefit societies, foundations, and social enterprises. Building on local roots, the social economy is based on solidarity and participation. It aims to serve people and the planet by putting profit back into communities, creating jobs and opportunities. The social economy landscape is diverse, with over 2.8 million organizations in Europe providing over 13.6 million jobs. 
For more information, visit ec.europa.eu slash social slash social economy. Thank you and welcome back to those of you who are watching us online at home and to the audience here in Brussels in La Tricoterie, which is an award-winning social economy venue in the heart of Brussels. So now we're going to uh, put under the spotlight some of the social entrepreneurs and social economy experts who we heard so much about before the break. And in this particular roundtable, we're going to be exploring the alliances for an economy that work for people. And we, we saw in that little video that the defining feature of the social economy is that it puts people before profits. So this is an element we're going to pick up on. Just as a reminder that if you'd like to ask a question to our panel, you need to use Slido. So you need to get your devices and phones out ready. You need to go to slido.com and you can take a picture of the QR code that you see on the screen now or you need to put in the hashtag SEAP2021 for the Social Economy Action Plan. And there you'll have a chance to submit questions and our members of our panel will be able to answer them. And let me just introduce who I have on the stage with me. Here to my right, um, it's Marta Lozano Malano, who's the founding member of the Wazo Cooperative, which creates opportunities for rural communities in Spain, particularly the Extremadura region. And sitting here, I have Sophie Fridland, who's from the organization called Just Arrived, and it's for work integration for migrants in Sweden. And I have Stefan van Tulder, who's the founder of Talent Data Labs in the Netherlands. So we're going to have a chance to hear from each of them about their experience and what they've done, and then we'll be bringing in questions that you put to them. So let me start with Marta. Tell us the story of Wazo. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to share the story of Wazo because it's the story of a group of young people of a rural region who left their land looking for opportunities, who achieved a successful career in creative industries abroad and then returned it to support the sustainable development of their community. Extremadura, that is our region, is, uh, is rural, is peripheral, is low populated, so we face many challenges related to unemployment, at risk of, of poverty population, um, transportation, but at the same time we have many, many potentialities. We have an amazing cultural and natural heritage, and that's why we decided to return. Uh, we returned to lead the change. The, we were tired of asking opportunities, so we decided to start offering opportunities for us and for others. But at the beginning in 2015, uh, we thought that houses were built starting from the roof. <laughs> and guess what? It's not. So that's how we arrived in social and solidarity economy. We understood that sustainable development was about, about people. And it's very similar to an airplane emergency. Uh, first, you need to put on your oxygen mask before being able to support others with their own mask. And this is what cooperatives are all about. So we decided to co-found our cooperative, Wazo Cop, that is a social cooperative working with social and solidarity economy and creative and cultural industries to support the sustainable development of the rural areas. So we empower the people from the local communities to boost their leadership, and we offer them meaningful experiences, uh, capacity building opportunities, knowledge, so they can, they can provide their uh, positive impact. So this is our tools, social economy and creative cultural industries. Can you tell me how the social economy adds value to local communities and why is that so important to, for rural areas? You've explained some of the challenges that exist in, in Extremadura, the lack of opportunity, the lack of transportation, the lack of infrastructure. How does the social economy add value and address that? Mm, we all know very well what social economy can, can uh, bring. Uh, it's about resilience, it's about sustainability, it's about inclusion. And in rural areas, it's very important. We are, we are very focused in general in rural areas to, to social services, agri-food. Uh, but 
why I think that is very important, I will, I will tell you from my perspective uh, about the Extremadura perspective, uh, because this is our, uh, our perspective, and also, you know, this kind of peripheral, low populated areas has to be also included in the mainstream. Um, as I said, we have many challenges, but um, we have problems with electricity, internet, you know, these kind of things of, of rural areas. But we have great streets with very flat, you know, floors to, to, to have walks. We have luxury buildings with top technology. But all of them are empty because it's free. You, we can use it for free, but nobody does because we are very focused in investing in things and not in people. And rural areas are about people. Social economy is about people. It doesn't only happen in my region, it's something general in my country. But we need to invest more in people, to invest in uh, strategic plans involving effective mechanisms to, to reduce uh, the, these kind of gaps that we have involving skilled people uh, to assist in these uh, this mechanisms of equality and equity as well, so we can foresee a scenario in short, medium, and long term. So I think that social economy is the key, but everything is not acceptable. We have to be creative, we have to be flexible, we have to be open-minded, and we have to, to recognize the legacy of the traditional social economy, but also if we want to have a fighter future, we also have to be innovative. Thank you. And now looking at the, the title specifically of our session, which is looking at alliances and partnerships for an economy that works for people. Uh, Sophie and Stefan, your organizations worked together, bringing your specific strengths to create something new. Can you tell us that story? How did that come about? Yes, of course. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, so I work for Just a Ride. What we focus on is the first and second job in Sweden for people that have migrated from outside Europe. And as we have heard today, this is uh, one of our biggest challenges, I think, in Europe, that there's a huge gap between foreign-born and uh, people that already live in, our, uh, in Europe. Um, so. This collaboration that we have with Talent Data Labs is that we um, basically match people through a system that can come over those challenges that we can see today. So you see three challenges most, mostly, which is language. Um, it is, um, uh, of course, that it's hard to validate people. And then lastly also that you can see that uh, we are biased as human beings. Even if we know about this, uh, we have a big, like it's really, really hard to not be. We kind of confuse competence with people that are like us. Um, so uh, I looked into the market, how can we overcome this? And I found Stefan. So maybe you can <laughs> tell us a little bit on how we overcome these three challenges. Um, yeah, sure. So I'm Stefan, I don't work at the same company as uh, Sophie, I work at Talent Data Labs, and the uh, interesting thing we try to do with the market is very simply validating that certain traits and certain competencies, certain skills, actually work out for a company, so lead to bottom line impact. And when we try to do that, so when we try to build profiles that have those competencies, one of the major things we notice is that a CV, like the way we traditionally look at talent, has almost no impact on someone functioning in society. But what we found with Just Arrived is that we're looking at CVs first, right? We're using LinkedIn, we're using social media, we're using a lot of things to validate whether someone is going to be able to function in, well, corporate society mostly. And none of these things really matter. So for, well, basically at Just Arrived, for immigrants and for people that are refugees that come from, imagine you have a degree at the University of Aleppo, right? It's, uh, it's a university that you can't validate anything of because it's gone, right? It's bombed, it's, there's nobody there anymore. So what we're really trying to do is try to use what we know, uh, scientifically know basically, to validate whether one of these immigrants can function highly or actually mm. can even succeed fundamentally in a company. Yeah, and to add on 
we have increased the amount of people we have matched to a job with 500% since we started this collaboration. So it is working and mostly also you can give feedback individually, even if this is optimized, we don't need more staff internally at just the ride. And still we can give personal feedback for the people we cannot match. So they, they know what to improve to, to get into the labor market. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, obviously you're a social enterprise, are you a, a, a company or also a social enterprise? Uh, both. <laughs> oh, you're both, okay. So, because I, I would be quite interested to see if, as a company, you changed the way you did some things as a result of, of you know, working together and collaborating with uh, um, Sophie's organization, which clearly is a social enterprise, because I think this is one of the really interesting keys. I mean, you've got fantastic impact results. But has it changed the culture of, and the way that you do things? Uh, first of all, I love this question. Uh, we were discussing it the other day because that's the, I think that's the core. So Nicholas said it as well, and I think before, um, well, Muhammad Yunus, of course, said it as well, is that we are, you know, we're trying to do things the same way over and over again, and uh, ultimately failing, probably in the end. Um, Sophie is one of those people that when she came to me, she basically said, you're doing a lot of the things you're doing for large corporates, right? Big names with a lot of cash that want to step in to hit financial effects. So can't we apply that somewhere? So she, she's the one that's been challenging us all the time, saying, okay, but listen, let's not chase the money, but let's chase the mass, the mass, the most amount of people. So that way of thinking the, for me was well, given to me by uh, Sophie. So for that, thanks. <laughs> because the, the reason I ask this is um, I moderate lots of different events, and I was very struck by an event I moderated even a couple of years ago, looking at the changing labor market and the need for skills change. And someone there reported the statistics, and they said that they survey, surveyed um, universities and 75% of the rectors of the university said, yes, we think our students are absolutely ready they're qualified for the business world. And they then went around and they interviewed the business sector. And exactly the same percentage of people said the students who come from university to the work environment are not qualified to work in a, in a real world practical experience. So this is, this is a core societal challenge. And you have linked up using your social values and your ethos with some of the hard data crunching and, and the, the numbers that you use to create something new. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about you know, this partnership, we, because that's the connective tissue of the social economy. We heard mm. from a, a Commissioner um, Bretto, he talked about knitting things together, creating connections. What advice would you give, given that you know, your, the, the result of what you did was when one and one is more than two, it's five or more. So what advice would you could give to people here in the, about the power of collaboration? Mm. Um, should I start? Um, one thing I would do, because I don't come from the social business, this is the first company I work in that has uh, the social aspect that is maybe higher than the monetary profit, um, but is to look at what other alliances are there in the corporate world and apply that to the social aspect and make sure, because people contact us all the time wanting to do things for pro bono, and that's great, but it never lasts. So you need to find a collab where we both make also a sustainable like, um, business profit as well. Uh, so that's really my recommendation to make it work in the long run. Um, yes. Thank you. Stefan. So I agree fundamentally with what Sophie said, but there's one thing that I think you can do to sort of find each other somewhere as well, and that's challenge each other a little bit, but subtly, right? Nudge each other. Um, there's nothing wrong with experimenting a little bit, right? So our technology base was really, it wasn't ready for this yet because we were also talking about, we're talking about immigrants with uh, no records whatsoever, right? So to find new ways of doing things also means you have to step outside, right? So you have to do something new. And if nobody's holding you accountable, if nobody's checking in on you, it gets very hard to do that casually because you get stuck in your day-to-day, -day, right? So everyone here must get stuck in one train ride or another, uh, to refer to Eunice again. Um, 
where it's really hard to step out if there's not someone that holds you accountable, right? And we find that with a lot of the parties we collaborate with, if nobody's holding you accountable at a certain point in time, if nobody's checking in on you, if nobody's measuring your progress, you're probably not gonna succeed. Um, and you're probably not gonna have a really good time either because we're beasts of burden in a certain way. So we try to win a little bit, right? So we try to grow as human beings. So um, that's what Sophie does for us and what Just Arrived does for us as well. They held us accountable. They show amazing records, right? They grow, well, 500%, I think, last year. And that's the, you know, that's satisfaction. That's your internal uh, motivation, right? And that's what you need. Thank you. And I'm just reminding you all that you can submit questions to our panel via Slido. We'd be delighted to put questions to, to the panel. But let me now bring uh, Marta in at this point. We, we've heard about the power of collaboration, uh, and this is very much about uh, alliances. If there are people who are watching this, and we know that many people have ideas about what they could do to improve their local community, and perhaps in the past their idea might be, well, we need to create an NGO to do it. What advice would you give them about saying, you know, social enterprise might be the way to go? My advice would be, I, I will make an example. Uh, for those who work with gender equality may know the expression of purple glasses. When you wear your purple glasses, you see, you see the inequalities, the gender inequalities. And I, I would recommend to use the social economy glasses to change this, their perspective but not only for those entrepreneurs who want to, to achieve something, to lead the change that they want in their lives, but also to the ecosystem, because without the ecosystem, it's impossible to make something in social economy. Uh, I would recommend to use these glasses to public authorities, so they can be less pushy with social economy, try to fit, make them fit in a suit that is too small for us, uh, and also, to social economy organizations in the territories that have to, to support the newcomers, to, to give the, this mentorship to, to help them to grow. Okay, thank you. We've got a couple of questions coming in on Slido, so let me invite you to, to reflect on that. We've got a question from Suzanne who says, what type of support do you need most to create or find these new alliances as a social enterprise? So, I mean, Sophie, you found Stefan. You went yeah. looking for something, you had a need and you went and found him. So what, what advice or what support would you have needed? Because that was probably a slow, painful yeah. process. Of course. And I mean, in general, there is quite a little science behind this type of new issues that we have today. So it was quite tough. But I think um, I've, I've always worked a lot with networking. <laughs> so my biggest uh, advice would be to uh, go to these kind of events and, and find friends and then ask them to help you find Stefan. <laughs> Stefan, what about you? What, what do you think uh, is the support that's needed that would help people find a partner for, for a social enterprise? I mean, you weren't looking for a social enterprise partner when Sophie arrived at your door. But what advice would you give people to keep an eye out to see how they could fit in or fill a need in a, a growing social economy environment? Um. Yeah, it's not necessarily true that I wasn't looking, right? So uh, the, these networking events she's talking about were, I frequented them as well, right? Because I always try to see if there's something we can invest in or something we can do there. But um, what I'm kind of missing in the market, and maybe I'm, I'm just overseeing this, is a social economy incubator, like a startup engine that maybe facilitates the attraction of these well, usually what they do, the entrepreneur first is a great example in the non-social space, right? But they take pairs, so they take two people and uh, put them together and let them fix a problem, right? Um, not per se a problem they come in with, but the problem they define later on. Um, and they pay them, they subsidize them a little bit. Uh, I think that's really effective in building entrepreneurs, but we could do the same in a social sphere, right? Especially when we have the subsidies, we have the development funds, right? We have plenty of resources to do this, so maybe I'm mistaken. Is there a source that does this? So at local levels, and in fact, our next panel is going to look at the issue of financing, so I think we will pick up on that. Um, what, Marta, maybe I could bring you in on this. You know, uh, you talked about um, how in, in Wazo it was people who came together to create something, who started, you know, building something together, so networking and 
alliances were part of what you're doing. What was the thing that you needed most to bring the people together, to get them all around the table and agree on what the problem was, what needed to happen, who was going to do what, what needs they were going to fulfill? I mean, that's the whole process. It was a long process. We had to knock many doors to do it. Uh, the, the way for us to, to get the involvement of the community was to, to be able to ensure social programs. So we learn how to write the programs, be very clear with what are the necessities, the challenges, and how we can involve them. So for us, that was the way, try to have the fund that from Europe, from the ministries, from the region, try to find this kind of work in order to be able to involve all of them. We are all very far in, in our region. We are very far from each other. And we need some funding to, to make you know, the way. I wonder if this is also linked to what came through strongly on the panel with the commissioners was the link to the circular economy. How increasingly, uh, you know, in, in local areas, we're starting to say, well, what businesses are here? What products do they make? What inputs do they need? And can we find ways of filling some of those gaps and building on that? So those are the kinds, again, of alliances that could be the basis for social enterprises and cooperatives. Is there anything uh, that you want to add around this issue of the circular economy? I think that this is very interesting. It's very needed, but also we have to be aware of what is the context and how we implement this social economy in places where are very deficient. It's very difficult to, to have it because you don't, ha don't have anything to, to recirculate. Yeah. So <laughs> it's very nice to have you know, the, the way of thinking, but also put it into the context with being aware of it. Okay, thank you. Um, Marta, we've got a, a little question. How did you explain the co-op to the local community? Was there any resistance? I, I mean, some people, you came back from the big towns to your small uh, villages and this, the, the rural area, and you had all these big ideas. It was, you know, uh, cooperatives are known because, you know, in, in my place is rural, agri food cooperatives yeah. are very well known, but other kind of cooperatives, worker cooperative, social cooperative as mine, are difficult. And the, the difficulty was to make them understand, you know, because they think it's, this is too good to be true. You know, it's ah. like you have social protection, you have sustainable jobs, and you are doing good for the community. This is too good <laughs> to be true. So yes, a little bit, but you know, to make them understand, to change mm -hmm. the perspective, to, you know, to put the glasses of the cops. And given that many regions in Spain, and you mentioned this in Extremadura, um, face depopulation, young people are leaving because there's no jobs, they leave to go to the cities. Do you see the model that you developed with the, the Waso Cooperative as being a counterbalancer, a way of attracting talent and keeping people in these areas? We think that our model is successful. In fact, we are trying to, to, to make others have the same, the same model as we have, and we are developing social projects. This is very interesting. We need to cooperate because we are those who are living the places. The people don't come to our places. We, we live in the yeah. place. So it's essential to work with us, but also with other regions. We are very open with this. We have to collaborate with people from other countries, with, from other regions, and that's the way to, to create the pathway to follow so we can live and the others can come with us. Thank you. I'm just going to have a little look at the other questions. Ah, um, who should be in the ecosystem of support? We have one question, which I'm not sure that we're qualified on this panel to answer, which is, in which countries does social entrepreneurship make up 15% of GDP? And again, that was at the beginning. I think that was one of the commissioners who said that currently it's 10% of GDP, but in some countries it's 15%. We don't have the answer, but I'm sure we can make sure we can get the answer for you. So uh, I think this is a great question for perhaps for you, Stefan. How do you measure your social impact? Sophie, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you can tell us here, and, and perhaps your impact is very clear in the number of people you get into jobs. But Stefan, how do you measure your social impact? As a uh, provider of software. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, so I sometimes make a joke and I say, like, I, I basically do nothing. Sophie does all the work. I roll my face over a keyboard and make sure, you know, whatever comes out works for her. Um, 
but more recently, we've also been looking at uh, things like uh, the happiness, satisfaction, engagement, uh, burnout indexes and everything. Uh, we're very curious about how we can prevent, uh, not just reduce, but also prevent most of the burnouts going on in uh, the climate today. Um, now, we're not so successful at um, basically stopping people from getting burnouts, but we're really successful at um, when we find, we will find people that are, are volatile, basically, so that are at the space where they're uh, uncomfortable and um, they risk a burnout, basically. We're very good at guiding them and aiding them very early on. Um, but if we don't get to those people, so reach is, I think reach is, is, is one of the major things we're talking about a lot. Uh, do not make it too esoteric, basically. We try to help people get some psychological aid before uh, they fit in an environment where they're just gonna guarantee burnout uh, before that. And, and already talk about transition, so move them to other positions, which is, it's really difficult to say if they would have gotten a burnout then, but we do find that they are definitely not happy in the environment they are. And burnouts still happen all the time. Of course. Sophie, how do you measure your social impact? Well, for us, it's <coughs> quite easy to turn it into numbers. If you look what an unemployed person costs for, for the society, for example. So I think this year we have saved uh, Sweden around 260,000 million euros uh, in unemployment fees only through our little <laughs> business. Um, so that uh, for us is quite easy, I would say. But then I think the social impact you do for the human being getting their first job after fighting for very often too many years, uh, you cannot put a price on that. That's, that's what motivates me. Thank you. Um, we've come to the end of the time for this panel. It's been absolutely wonderful talking to you, uh, to Marta, to Sophie, and to Stefan. So can we say a warm thank you to the three of them? And I'm now going to invite in, uh, people to join me for the next panel, where we're going to be picking up on that all-important issue about how do we finance the scale-up. And I, I just uh, want to end on the, on the message that we had from Sophie at the end, which is, you know, you don't measure your impact in money. It's not about the money. It's just how you help people in the end. And, and when you see the difference it makes to people's lives, that that's worth everything. So let me invite the people to come and join me for this next panel. I have Victor Yanku, who's the co-founder and president of the Cooperativa de Energy, which is for sustainable energy in Romania. So please come and join me. I have Vesna bashansky Ajik, the executive director at the Mosaic Foundation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I have Jean Moho, who's the co-founder of Phoenix, which is a zero waste economy activity in France. And Georg Chara, who's the CEO of Sign Time, which deals with sign language in Austria. So, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna have another chair brought up for you, don't worry. Excellent, thank you so much. So, welcome all of you to the panel, and um, I'm, I'm just, just before we get started, remember that, that, that uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton said, the money is there, it's in the Resilience Fund, member states have got it, if you've got an idea, go for it. And that's a wonderful invitation, but it's not quite as easy as knocking on a door, is it? And just saying, give us the money. There's a lot more involved in it. So I'm going to ask each of you to, to share some of it. And Victor, I'm going to start with you. Um, how did you get the money to start up your organization? Did investors understand the business model of the social economy? So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation. It is a great uh, honor to be able to share our experience at this level and with this uh, audience. Uh, we founded uh, the cooperative two years ago with uh, a big ambition to become uh, a supplier and a producer of green uh, energy in a cooperative system. This is the first uh, energy cooperative in Romania and uh, unfortunately still the, is the only one uh, even now. So uh, <coughs> in terms of founding, we went through several stages. The first step was to raise the minimum uh, social capital uh, which is 30,000 to euro, is regulated by the European legislation. Fortunately for us, it was not a major problem, but I believe for a cooperative with lower ambition, it is an important barrier that should be removed or reduced. In the second step, 
After the establishment, we started to present the concept and the business model in many interest groups as possible. For, um, <coughs> for an energy cooperative, you need a lot of members and in this sector, you also need a lot of uh, money. So when we start to present the model, we grow to around uh, 500 uh, members. In step three, in order to enter the supply market, we bought a supplier from the market with uh, an amount of uh, around half a million uh, euros. It was a easy, <coughs> a better way to, to enter into the market because we buy a licensed vendor with procedures, with trade volumes, and a small team of uh, people working already there. So how did we, did we finance the, the, purchase, the purchase? So <laughs> around 400,000 euros we borrowed from our member for uh, periods from uh, one to five years. And uh, we are lucky to have a good relation with uh, Som Energia in uh, Spain, a cooperative, uh, an energy cooperative, which help us with another, another 100,000 uh, euros. So at all level, at, <laughs> at uh, all level, uh, and for stage, or all stages, the principle that guide us were awareness. We need people to be aware of social economy alternative, education. You need to explain what social economy is and what the benefits are, not only for profit. And if you borrow money to a cooperative or if you invest in a cooperative, you have also other kind of uh, benefits, and uh, transparency. Members must have uh, access to all business data, and uh, the important decision must be collected. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, for explaining you know, how you, you found the funds to launch it, and also the, the relationship between bringing in a, a larger, more established cooperative elsewhere to share not just funding, but presumably experience and help get things off the ground. Vesna, let me turn to you because you, you have two hats here. You have the Mosaic Foundation and you're also a member of the board of the Philanthropy Association Europe. Um, let me ask you, looking at the bigger persp perspective around young people, and I think this is particularly important given that the impacts of the pandemic fall unequally in society. If we look back at 2008, the last time we had an economic crunch, young people lost out. So what do you think social enterprises offer young people as a tool for creating economic opportunity? I, I just have to add to this context, so coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we have the highest youth unemployment rate in, in, uh, in Europe that is going to 34%. So it's just additional uh, what they need and what we can do for them. So I think that um, many of young people were running away from country because it, it, they didn't have an opportunities. And then opportunities for them meant job. And then speaking about jobs and agreeing with what Professor Yunus said, it, then we decided that we should go for self-employment. And then when we start to speak about this, because we also live in a country where entrepreneurial spirit is the lowest, again, in, in, in Europe, um, we told that giving them money to start their own social enterprises is a win-win solution. They don't want to be entrepreneurs in the corrupted world, but young people do want to do something good for their own communities and, and then sell and create jobs. So that was our idea. Um, many told that it was ambitious, that it was highly risky, that this is not something that should be done. But being a private foundation, we had this freedom to, to experiment and then to try. And uh, fortunately, it worked really well. So right now, we are giving to young people first money, because again, as Professor Yunus said, money is important. But then also, when we start to work with them on their social enterprises, and social businesses, we want them to be a business. And being a business means being alive on the market. So we don't measure how many businesses we registered. We measure how many of them survived first year, third year, fifth year, and what amount of their money is coming as a revenue from the market. So um, our support goes beyond this money. So we would give them small grant if it's really tiny business and then up to 20,000 um, uh, money to, to pilot, to be a real startup, to pilot the idea not to forget, at the beginning, they were integrating social impact into their business model. 
And then you have to make money on the market to be able to finance this social impact. So this is how it goes. And then whatever they need, and this is really what we are uh, telling to them, whatever you need, we will make sure that you will get it. Now we have 40 employees, we have mentors on sales, people are really going with them to sell something until they are not ready to, de to do it by, by themselves. And then we had this issue with the scaling. Because 20,000, it's okay if you are starting something, but then suddenly if you are successful in your economic impact and your social impact, then you want to scale. And it meant a bit bigger amounts of money. And to be honest, so there is a money over 300,000. There is a money over one or three million. However, to jump from this 20,000 to 300,000, you need to be a real acrobat. And this is something that we could not do it. And in, in thinking, again, what we can do, we said that, you know, it's like we need more partners. And we built something that is now online community with 78,000 registered members and 150 annual visits to that uh, online community. Every year there is half a million that is given in grants and half a million given in, in, in investment. And uh, then we start to build partnerships with, for example, financial institution, for the first time in the entire re region, we have a, a social banking. Then we were so happy that some investors said, ah, we will, we will do the convertible grants. And then we bump with our heads to, to the big wall that is called legislation, because convertible grants does not, do not exist. What we did, then we turned to our European friends here at, at Philanthropy Association Europe, asking what is good practice in Europe? in European Union, to be honest, because we are Europe too, in European Union, and we're really surprised to hear that even at this, at EU level, there are so many legal constraints that were not addressed properly, that still foundations here, who have like 60 billion euros and would love to support social uh, businesses and social economy because this is in their stomach, in their heart, quite often cannot do, do you to legal, legal uh, restrictions like you know, benefiting from single market and, and similar things. So we are now happy to see this and we also, this document and we also look forward how this will develop because whatever is going on in European Union will also go to wider Europe and we are happy to see that recommendations also work this way that many young people will be able to get finances they need to be social entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. And particularly on this issue of legislation, let me invite uh, Jean Mahot to come in on this because um, we, we heard from Professor Yunus that you know, if, if the rules or the banking rules or the definitions of the problem change that. Uh, we've just heard uh, from Vesna that some of the challenges she's had in helping small organizations to scale up and there just isn't the legal framework. So how does legislation create an enabling framework for social enterprises that try to address some of the big societal challenges we heard about, youth unemployment, energy, um, lack of opportunity? Yeah, sure. I can uh, share a word on that. So um, I am the co-founder of Phoenix. We are a French uh, social enterprise fighting food waste trying to connect those who have too much with uh, those who have not enough. So we are saving and sold products from destruction and doing two things for our clients, which are retailers or industrials. We have a B2B marketplace connecting shops and charities, like food banks, etc., in order to save the, the volumes from destruction. And we have also um, a B2C mobile application, the Phoenix application. It's uh, available here in Brussels, so you can download it uh, uh, right now, if you want, and you can, as an individual, also save baskets from uh, food waste uh, in any shop around you. Uh, and just to give you a couple of figures, so we were created back in 2014. Uh, today we are um, 230 people, employees. Um, we are above the 15 million euros of revenues threshold, and we saved more than 150 million meals uh, since inception. It's uh, 130,000 meals saved uh, each day. So how, do we, how did we succeed in scaling and fighting food waste at scale in Europe? Partly through uh, funding, and I will come back to that, and partly through um, 
a positive and uh, and um, and yeah, contributive regulatory framework in France, not in Europe. In France, we have two things that helped us. First is a uh, fiscal deduction, fiscal incentive, uh, which is like um, a compensation for uh, in-kind donations. So if you, as a person or if a, a business, a company, gives a pallet of food, a milk, uh, any biscuits or, or, or rice, they are eligible in France to a 60% tax deduction on the corporate tax. So it's a good incentive to give rather than destroy landfill, incinerate, or put in, in, in the bio waste uh, classical and traditional uh, 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 subsidiaries. So that's the first uh, hand of the regulatory framework that helped us. And the second one is not a positive one, it's more a, um, a reprehensive one. It's a low banning food waste in all the supermarkets above 40, uh, 1400 square meters. And it's uh, more recent, it was um, created in, in 2017. Uh, it's called La Loi Garo en France, and it's just making sure that no product uh, before expiration, so day minus two, day minus one, D date versus expiry date, no product is uh, destroyed or incinerated. And it, it must be given or sold at a discount to people in need or to people uh, looking for additional purchase power. So we have those two aspects, a positive one, an incentive, based on tax and fiscality. And, uh, and another one, which is this uh, regulation banning food waste and making it um, illegal with a 10,000 euro fine per, uh, per uh, destruction. So yes, it, it did help us in France. We are still pushing the regulation to, to go from France to all the European countries because France, uh, once in <laughs> for once in history, has a four or five years in advance on, on, on a topic and is a, clearly a, one of the leaders on fighting food waste. So we are very proud of it and we should uh, promote this example. And thanks to that, we had good results. And thanks to our good results, we could raise money. And we, so we, we, how did we got financed? We raised more than 20 million euros, which is a significant amount in the, in the startup in general, but in the social economy in particular in three rounds. First round was a seed round, and then Inco uh, and Aviva, um, the impact investors, uh, backed us in 2017, so in, in the early days. And then more recently, we did a, a 20 million financing round with a more uh, London-based impact investors or traditional green tech funds uh, looking into the impact. But we can, uh, just three three us to, to conclude, I, what I can share with you with that, there is a big change between 2014 and now, we can see it. I mean, a lot of uh, impact investment funds were created, a lot of dedicated pockets within traditional funds for, in, for impact investments were, um, were created between over the past three years. Um, so yeah, yes, it's the day and night before uh, versus 10 years ago. Secondly, there is still a disconnection between the appetite, the methodology, uh, the risk uh, profile of the traditional venture capital players and the more uh, impact investors one. We, are, we work on two legs so we can be uh, sexy for a traditional VC fund because we have a technology component and we are a startup. So we could raise with any traditional VCs, and, and sometimes we have offers from them. And when we compare them to the offers received from impact investors, there is still a significant disconnection in terms of amounts, valuation, ambition. So we need, as a, as a, as a group, to decomplex ourselves, <laughs> to be more ambitious, and to, and to have more leaders, more Dr. Lee, more blah, blah, blah. We can also create big champions. There is no, I mean, sport is beautiful, and it's an option, but we can also create uh, uh, big companies uh, fighting uh, at scale, uh, big pro big problem. And I think that's uh, probably what we what we need to do: more role models, more ambition, and and more success stories to to empower and to and to give uh, energy to the the new generations to show that it's possible. Thank you very much, Georg. Let me bring you in uh, at this point because your organisation benefited from some EU funding which helped you to scale up and do things. Can you tell us what difference it made getting an EU grant to how you worked and what you were able to do? Yeah, um, let me first describe what we are doing. Um, we, we are a company that translates texts uh, and videos and other digital content 
uh, into sign language. And for that purpose, we use a, um, a self-developed uh, avatar system. So it is a AI-based, 3D animation-based uh, system that helps to translate partly automatically or semi-automatically uh, digital content into sign language. Um, the thing is that to scale up such a business, uh, you need a lot of money. Uh, we got funded by, by the Horizon 2020 program, um, especially with the SME instruments. It was our first uh, big funding. And that enabled us to develop the whole technology uh, system to, to set up a, a very well developed um, a qualified team and to develop a minimum viable product that is uh, uh, ready for the market. To scale up, we were faced with uh, a lot of demand of money. That is because uh, sign language, you know, is in, in every country. If you want to change it to another country, you need another sign language. So there's a lot of additional costs. You have to digitalize the new sign language from the other country, or even if you want to change the domain. So we translate uh, uh, announcements in public transport systems, for example. It's a completely different task than to translate for example, uh, package leaflets of medicines. So if you just change the domain or you change the language, you have a lot of costs just to set up the new system. So therefore, we needed um, a lot of money to scale up because to scaling up was part of our vision. Our vision is to make the whole digital content accessible for deaf people worldwide. So it's a big uh, uh, vision, and for that big vision, we need big money. So what we learned after the, the, the public funding, the grants from the Horizon uh, Instruments, but also uh, we got some, some um, fundings from the e, um, EASI program. <laughs> I think everybody here knows what it is. Um, what we learned is that uh, you get the fundings from the, from the government, from the, from the public sector to set up a system to, to produce a first product to enter the market. But if you want to scale up, you need other money because you cannot always get money from the, from the public. And to, to reach the money, to get the money from the, from the private sector, you have to accept the rules of the private financial markets. Uh, we hear a lot of uh, visions and, and great ideas about uh, alternative economic systems and financial systems, especially from uh, Mohammed um, um, uh, Yush Yunus. Yunus, thanks. <laughs> um, very interesting theories, but we uh, we face a very different world in, in our environment. We face a world of investors, and even though we just address um, impact investors, or impact investors are also investors. And what does investor looking for? They're looking for impact investors, looking for a very high social impact. That's the one side. But they also look at uh, a, a very uh, valid um, uh, business plan. And that means you need uh, a marketable product, um, a reasonable time to market, and reasonable profits. You have to offer this to an investor, otherwise you are not interested for them. Because all the investors also have to have their plans, they have to, to, to recoup their money. So what, what our learning was uh, in these uh, uh, financial rounds, in the, in the public financial rounds was, we have to be fit for the private capital market because our world works in that way. Um, especially if you want to scale up in, in, in uh, uh, in big dimensions, as I described. If we, if we entered a, a new language market, we have to make new digitali uh, digitalizations of new languages. Sign languages are differ very strong to each other, uh, and there's a lot of, of, of money we need because uh, the organic growth is, in, in that scale, it's not possible. So that was our learning in the, uh, and what we, what we also, um, uh, what our profits from the, uh, from the funding. Thank you, Jean. I think uh, you wanted to come yeah, in on this. Yeah, just one, one, one word. I, I do agree 100% to what you just said, and that's uh, kind of a pity because we try to embody something alternative and we end up with very traditional capitalist uh, systems and schemes and we sell capital and sell shares to traditional investors and we get diluted and we don't share the value so much. With uh, So it's I think we could collectively try to... Yeah, to have the full picture of uh, what should be an alternative economy. And today, I mean, in the case of Phoenix, we ended, we ended up in a very traditional 
uh, capitalist play, uh, and that was not, that was not the plan initially. So that's <laughs> uh, we could have done things. Uh, I mean, we, no, we 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 didn't. It was not possible to do it uh, an, uh, another way around. So. So it's, I mean, we, we heard the call from Professor Yunus who said the EU needs to create a fund that's available that can at scale support social enterprises uh, and if necessary change the rules to allow that to happen. It sounds to me both, uh, uh, Georg and Jean, you're, you're both describing trying to fit what you do into the the language of investors, and even if they're impact investors, they've still got a very hard eye on the bottom line and on the market readiness. Um, do you, what do you think about this idea that, they, that Europe should have a special funding mechanism, that there should be some, something special that's created because the social economy is a different animal? And I can see several of my panel want to come in on this. This, this is a hot topic. So, Georg, let me start over there, and then I'll come... All the way through. Yeah. Now, I think it's a great idea to, to create uh, such, a, such a special funding for the, uh, for the impact companies, we call them that, that way. Um, even though that we think, and we are not just a, a, a social company, we are also a tech startup because we developed a lot of technologies in the AI and in the animation and all that stuff. Um, but uh, if we have to compete with uh, with other companies, they are creating, um, they're building uh, satellites for um, um, satellite technology to measure carbon uh, uh, in, 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 in the atmosphere. Uh, it's hard to compete with them, um, even though we think we produce something like rocket science, of course. Uh, so if we had just to compete with other social companies, it would be much easier for us, and I think also for other companies, because then the best uh, and the, the companies with the most social impact would be funded first, and this is a different view than to, to, uh, to finance companies with the... Um, with, with the best profit, uh, um, um, the best profit they can they, they can produce. Thank you, Vesna. Let me bring you in on this because we're sort of in the era of traditional philanthropy, which is where they invest in the unbankable and unmarketable because they're do, they're investing in doing good. And that's you know once they've made their money, uh, whether it's an endowment fund or something else, whatever spare they've got under their charity giving they invest in, in social enterprise. But we, we're talking about something quite different, a whole new category of funding. What, what's your addition to this conversation? I would say yes. And I would say yes to any, any type of, of financing. You are right, this is a different animal, but it's not one. Then variety of different animals. And in fact, what, should, what we all should be creating that um, uh, this um, different variety of financing is available for a company, social businesses that are on different level of development. Some of them will be able now to go to bank, take a loan, pay it back, but some of them will not. And we see it as a, as a, as a, as a mall. So instead of saying, ah, you are a social enterprise, you should go all go there and then play on your own all, uh, uh, playground, I think that this is also a danger because then you will be perceived as someone who is surviving because of subsidies or this fund, and you are not really a business, and you are not really the playing the real game. So I think that every sort of financing should be there. Every business, including social ones, should be focused on the market, but then for a different stage of development, they should be able to have different sources of funding. You, for your marketing, that, that puts you in a, such a big disadvantage, and you are doing great impact, of course you should get grant or you know impact investment for this. But then later on, you should be able to go on a market. What is happening right now on the Balkan, because there are like money coming from non-profits in the form of funds, for social enterprises, instead of having successful businesses, there is something, we are joking about this, but this is like pitching mafia is developing. So the main business model has become to win a project or to, you know, to, to win a pitch instead of to go to market. So all financing, but then making sure that revenue from the market is the one that I'm proud of. Thank you. Victor, can I bring you in on this conversation? 
I think definitely we need to start the fund because uh, now is the time to increase confidence in social economy. And we have to be aware that not all the social economy initiatives will be successful. And uh, if we want to have uh, an increased level, we need to accept that some of them will fail. And it's better to have some guarantees or something from the state or from the European, uh, from the European community, and not to be only just uh, everything on the the laws to be all the all or all, all uh, translated to the citizens. Jean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, coming back to what I said, I think, I think impact investing is the first good step because they are um, slightly uh, less, uh, putting less pressure, mm, slightly more patient. The cycles are more five to seven, to nine years rather than four or five years. Um, less greedy also in terms of return. And some of them are um, real impactors and not uh, wannabe impactors or these guys, traditional funds. Uh, but still, um, I, I, I stick to what I said, it's, it's still traditional capitalist systems. I have one thing in mind that is merging in France and could be a good option, but it's not very mature st and, it, and it's quite complicated. But it's a good, it's a good, uh, a good try. It's called the uh, Les Contrats à Impact Social. It's uh, like a, th uh, a three parties uh, partnership between um, an entrepreneur, um, which is uh, setting standards in terms of positive impact on the uh, social and environmental impact, saying within three years I want to save uh, 10 million meals in, tel in that and that and that city, financed by uh, a, th a third party um, bank, for example. And then, so the bank would finance uh, three, four, five, ten millions. And then at the end of the three years, we do the, um, an extra financial assessment of the, of the program. And if it, were, if it was successful, and if, we, if you did uh, overperform your, uh, your plan, if, if you did deliver the results, then the state, the French state, would uh, give back the money to the, to the bank, to the investors, and th rewarding the, the positive impact on the, on the society. And that could be an alternative uh, financing system, quite uh, innovative and quite uh, smart to, to traditional uh, funding um, mechanisms. Okay, thank you. Let, let's pick up on, on a new element that's been brought in from the audience. Uh, Toby has asked us, you know, what non-financial support should we be putting in place to accompany a growth in some of these finance products and opportunities? Jean, you went through several rounds of, you initially had a seed funding and then you had more money that came in. Um, you, you talked, Vesna, about, you know, you've got, there's a small 20,000 and then the next big hurdle is 300,000 and to get from 20,000 to 300,000, there's a lot of skill development, competency, business understanding, et cetera. So, panel, would you like to reflect on this? A apart from funding, what else should we put in place to accompany it? We recognize, Victor, that social enterprises like businesses will fail, but what can we put in place to accompany that? Vesna, do you want to come in on this and first, and then, Jean, I'll come back to you and uh, Georg and Victor. Gladly, because I think that we went all the path and we made all mistakes that are able, that are possible to make outside. We first developed like 28 modules, program, investment ready programs, then we had a lot of money to paying mentors, we brought them someone from Google or to do this or that, then we this, did a, a mentoring program that it's on their request. At the end, what makes a difference yeah. is that you build community that instead of making sure that control is in our hands as a business support organization, that it's in our hands that entrepreneur has to go from point A to point B, if he succeed to build community where sometimes someone who is just one step ahead will help, help her much more than any mentor we can bring from anywhere, and then make sure that they build trust and they build an ecosystem of support when of course we'll be there and bring whoever can take them to the next step. But rather I'm giving up of control in our hands with different mentoring programs, different training programs, and putting con control in the hands of, of entrepreneurs. I now need this and I don't need that. And I, for the next step I need this. And then making sure that whatever it is, we will put it to the community. That really worked well. Then we like blossomed. And what is important, all costs reduced, are reduced mm -hmm. because. Thank you. Jean. I can, um, 
I can make three recommendations. First is uh, I would like to have the public entities as contractors rather than as uh, subsidiaries or finances. I would like exemplarity from the EU Commission, from the French state to fight food waste in all their uh, restaurants and all their administrations. That would be a good signal. Second, um, credibility through communication. It doesn't cost a lot for you to promote uh, success stories for free. And it, it, it's, uh, it means a lot for us in terms of uh, sexiness, uh, employee brand, attract talents, attract consumers, and, 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 and spread the message. So I would love to have uh, this kind of support from public entities. And the third one would be, I mean, from my experience, the team makes a, lot, a big difference. And when we are a social enterprise, at least in France, you subscribe to a rule which is called uh, uh, l'agrément Esus, and you try to cap your salaries between one to seven. And during the first years, there is no problem with that, because seven times uh, the minimum wage still uh, gives you a firepower. But when you, when you scale and you need to attract um, top managers from other structures, then sometimes there is a mismatch between your mission, I mean your values, and the market standards, and you cannot contract or hire the best talents because you won't be in breach with your uh, commitments, but sometimes there is this, uh, this mismatch between what you sign in your bylaws and what you should have uh, on, your, uh, on your payroll to get to the next level. So. Maybe give a, a little couple of uh, a bit of flexibility on the on that on that rule to, to make sure that uh, everything is aligned. Thank you, Victor. I think it would be very nice to have a platform where we can share our experiences because we want to develop social economy in all the European uh, states. And I will give you a very simple example. We started uh, our cooperative in Romania. Uh, we have a friend in uh, Spain who was the manager of Som Energia. He came with the idea. We went uh, three people for two days in Spain, and then we bu built our own uh, cooperative. Uh, it was very difficult to, to, to do the papers in Romania, and it cost a lot of money for us, and it took us six months. But once we did it, we, provide, we can provide these uh, this, this papers, let's say, to other cooperatives for free. So that's why it would be important to share our experiences from different domains and to see how things uh, work in uh, different countries or different, different parts. And this not, not cost, uh, we don't need fancy, fancy events or something, we just need to share our experiences. But I think it's, it, it would be great to have this in the future. Thank you. Georg? Yes, I can tell about our own experience uh, we made with uh, non-financial support uh, that comes, uh, came with the, with the financial support together. So we, we could um, uh, ask for a very, very specialized consultants, and they, 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 they brought a lot of uh, very specialized know-how into our organization that was very helpful in the past. And also, uh, uh, what was very helpful was the, the networking, yeah, because uh, the, um, the financial institute, inti institutions, they, they know a lot of companies, they know, uh, my, they know my customers sometimes better than I do, and they, they, they can give me the, the, the contact details, they can open the door, and mm -hmm. this is very helpful. This is, um, is, I think it's compared to the financial support, it's, it's not so, so uh, expensive, but it's, uh, it's, it's very useful. Thank you. And let me, um, we've just got a, a few minutes left in our session. Let me ask you what I've asked previous panels, uh, which is advice. What advice would you give to people who have got an idea, they think that the social economy is the way to go, um, or maybe they've already got a little something that's just one, one and a half people, and they're thinking they might like to grow and go further. You've all been down this path. And um, Vesna, you said that sometimes the person who's just one step ahead of you is the best person to show you the way and to light the path for you. So given that you're at different stages on your paths, what would you say to the people who are just behind you? What's the advice you would give? Jean, let me start with you. Mm, I, I, think, I know that uh, what helped me most was to indeed get in touch with more uh, major entrepreneurs, uh, people who are like one or two steps ahead, and also to, to, um, to go out of the traditional social economy uh, ecosystem and to, and to talk to traditional startups, to talk to, uh, I mean, to, 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 yeah, to, 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 yeah, to, 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 to mix things and tools and ambitions and talents and 
yeah, to, to get out of this uh, ecosystem and to, and, and, to, and to mix with other uh, cultures and also and other drives. It, it helped a lot because I was uh, always talking to the same players, the usual suspects of the social economy in France uh, for four to five years. And then it was a refresher for me to go also to see the traditional ecosystem and to, to see that there was a, this gap to, to compensate for us. So was that a mentality gap yeah. that the people in the social economy w were used to a certain size and their ambitions were more limited? And when you moved out of that, people were, had much bigger ambitions and, and, and different perspectives. Try to help us to understand, because you're a social economy that's come quite far. I mean, that, that given your size, you, you, mm. you would count as a medium-sized company, yeah. more or less, for Europe. So you'd obviously at a very different scale from many other organizations. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to generalize because you have, uh, you, there, was, there were a lot of uh, big uh, social enterprise before us. Mm -hmm. uh, so some entrepreneurs had, uh, obviously, a lot of ambition in France. You have the Groupe SOS, you have uh, Vitamin T, and, and, and many others, uh, La Croix Rouge. Or, so, but still, I, I do think there is this discrepancy in terms of methodologies, um, talents, um, ambition, tools, efficiency, and some of them are not good for our ecosystem, but some of those practices could create a lot of uh, value to, in our ecosystem. I mean, it, it helped a lot for me to, to talk to, as I said, to people from Dr. Lieb, from uh, Blablacar, not traditional poor players of the uh, social economy, but still with an impact, a kind of an impact, and having scaled classical solutions, but for me to adapt their methodology to my extra financial mission was uh, very powerful. Thank you. Victor. So, if, if you have an idea, you have to check if somebody else uh, did it in, uh, in other part of the EU. You can put questions and ask, because uh, <coughs> in my point of view, we are not in a competition with other uh, entities from other countries. Share experience, try to build a community Small or large, it depends on how 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 good is the idea or how can you communicate it uh, well, and then go for it and try to try to build something. Thank you, Vesna. Um, it's it, uh, uh, there was there is this saying that it takes a village to raise a child, and we just say this to to people: it takes a village to build a company, and you will fail because. If you are an entrepreneur, you take risk and you will fail. And then when you fail, you will need a social capital. So build it from zero, day zero. Look for a, for a community, just as you said. Thank you. Georg. Yeah. Um, I would tell them uh, social business consists of two words, social and business. And uh, the social impact builds your story, your storyline, yeah, your narrative. But... Uh, keep your, your your business case in mind. Um, and let me uh, reflect just on one thing, because we have five minutes left on this panel, and I think so I have time to ask you one more thing. Post-pandemic, there's a rethink coming, a reset on what's important and how we do things. Where do you think the social economy could most make a difference with the way that we need to change our society post-pandemic? Now, maybe I'll, I'll invite you to think on that first. We heard a lot before um, the break about the importance of aligning with people's values. We heard how much the social economy stepped up during the pandemic, whether it was making masks, whether it was food for the vulnerable, whether it was connecting people who needed shopping to have done for them because they couldn't leave. So the social economy has played a frontline role in the response to the pandemic. But when we talk about planning the post-pandemic world, and we know that our economies have been changed irrevocably. Our supply chains have been broken. We've changed our, our views on many different things. We had an invitation from the commissioners for the social economy to step up. If we've got ideas that there is an open door. So where do you think the social economy could have the greatest impact? First, I, even, even if pandemic is gone like this, like tomorrow there is no corona. I think what it has happened, we are all aware how vulnerable we are, and we are all aware that this resilience that we are building, in fact, it can go. And so what we see as, as a social economy way forward 
is in fact that you know economy without social will not exist anymore. And this is something, something that we need to move now. Taking care about your employees was part of CSR 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Right now, everyone is taking care about employees. And CSR, it's, it stops to exist as a concept. Why? Because regular businesses are integrating social impact one way or another into their uh, uh, function. So what, what will help health to, to happen globally as evolution, that these strange boundaries between being like economy that is only maximizing profit and then being those not non-profit guys with their crazy ideas, this will have to uh, um, disappear because we need sustainable, economically sustainable solutions for huge social problems. So I think that social economy is the only way forward. I don't know how long it will take, but that's it. Thank you. Mm. Georg, let me turn to you, because one of the big changes through the pandemic was the acceleration of the use of technology. When people had to start working from home, we had to develop you know, methodologies and, and technologies for that to happen. In the health sector, there's been a massive use of virtual consultations, etc. So it's... It's an enormous area of potential of growth for technology. The particular area you work in is making sure that people with disabilities or who, who have hearing problems have access to it. So it's an application of very high tech, the AI latest development. Do you see that market growing? Do you see there to be economic potential and this big shift to the digital that's happening to make sure that underserved needs can also be met? Is that a viable business proposition for you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we see that uh, home office and distance, everything, distance learning, uh, distance conferencing, half of the conference, this is, a, is, a, is hybrid. So um, we see that the, this is the new normal, even after the, if we have uh, the post-COVID uh, time, then it, it would be very normal to, to, to switch people from all over the world to a conference like that or to work together with them. So for us, it gave us a, a big push because we had to invest a, a little bit in, into technology to, uh, um, to make uh, the people ready uh, to, to work from home because it's not easy. With the, uh, we work with a lot of volumes of data. Uh, but it works, and uh, after the COVID uh, situation, it still will work in that way. And I think we need half of the space of the of the offices, and uh, twice of the technology to connect people to the company's um, uh, systems. Thank you. And, and just as you were speaking, saying we need half of the office, in my mind, immediately a big light went off and said, we need social enterprises to come in and see what can we do with this empty unused office space. I mean, they, we, we have shortages and needs in other areas. I'm sure if we watch this space, we'll see a whole bunch of new social enterprises coming forward for that. Let me now turn to, uh, to Jean and Victor. You know, two of our biggest challenges when we look forward on climate are energy and tackling food waste, because you know, there's a, between 30 and 50 percent of our food is lost in the production cycle and in consumers' fridges. We won't meet our climate targets, unless we get to grips with that, unless we can produce and manage and consume energy more effectively and more renewably. So to what extent do you think organizations like yours have the potential to be at the front of this, or are you always going to be at the back of the wave dealing with the bits that can't be dealt with by the big players? Victor. First of all, we need to have uh, access to finance, same as the big players. If the, the European bank gives a, give a lot of money to big companies, we also need as a small producers to have access to, 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 cheap, to, cheap, uh, to cheap loans and to, to be very easy to, to access, not to have a lot of bureaucracy behind. So this, this will uh, help a lot. And uh, I have to admit, now in the energy sector, as a small player, it's, it's not, uh, you don't have time to to think too much because the prices are uh, higher every day. And uh, I'm not very happy to say, but I think after uh, six months or uh, one year, 
we will have only big companies in the sector and not uh, small suppliers because they cannot, uh, they cannot survive this uh, period. So it's not only about uh, social economy and cooperatives in this sector, it's also about uh, smaller players that, that they can simply just not uh, survive. If we can, we can uh, have a look at the uh, uh, UK market or uh, Germany, we will see this daily, we will read in the newspapers about uh, a small supplier that goes out of the market. Thank you. Jean? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a tricky question because I would... Um I mean, I would love to say that uh, we'll gradually replace the traditional waste, manager, waste management players like Veolia, Suez, but they are around $40 billion company, and we are 15 million, so probably it's also wishful thinking. So our first uh, job is to show another way, another path, and, and show that it's credible and it's viable and it can scale. So probably not up to $40 billion, but uh, it, it's scalable. And but we also we also have proofs that it can happen. For example, in France, in the retail uh, sector, we have Biocop, which is a cooperative model, and they are around two billion euros of turnover with uh, more than six hundred shops, and a, a, um, a real alternative and a credible alternative to traditional retailers. So. I'm balanced between the two, just being the small uh, piled fish showing another way and the poil à gratter the, of the big players. But sometimes when my dreams are, <laughs> uh, are crazy, I, I think, okay, we should be the new standard in the coming years and we should be, I mean, we should be the, not the exception, but the, the, the norm. So let's see in a, in, a, in a couple of years. Thank you. And I'm sure at a future conference, you'll come back and tell us yeah. how well you've done. <laughs> I'd like to say a warm thank you to our panel members, to Georg, to Vesna, uh, to Victor, and to Jean. Thank you for helping us decode the issue of how you finance the scale-up. So thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic conversation we've had this afternoon and in this last session we're coming full circle back to the action plan and as a reminder today is the launch of the the social economy action plan and here we're going to look forward to see what needs to happen next and there'll be a call for support for the implementation of the action plan so i'm delighted to introduce to you the three speakers who are joining me on this panel so i have patrice toya who is one of the co-chairs of the European Parliament's Social Economy Intergroup. I have Mr. David Erhard, who is from the Permanent Representation of France to the European Union, and Juan Antonio Pedrino, who is here, who is the President of Social Economy Europe, and who's just told me he's got 40 years of experience in cooperatives. So we have a, a long track record here to share. Um, I, I warned you that we were going to use French and Spanish in this session, so I do hope those of you who are here, you've picked up a headset. Those of you at home, you should be able to see on your screen, you should have an option to choose the language you want to listen to. So, Patricia, let me start with you. Um, the European Parliament Social Economy Intergroup has been very active over a number of years and obviously calling for this action plan. Now that it's out, do you see your priorities reflected in it? And how do you see the, few, the way that you can cooperate in the European Parliament to make sure this gets rolled out and implemented at national level? Well, thank you. Yes. I think you can hear me. Can you hear me? Problem. Yes. yes. OK. Is it working? Yes, that works. Well, I hope it's working. Uh, so, on behalf of the intergroup, uh, I'm here to show the commitment of the intergroup concerning uh, uh, the different actions for the implementation of the action plan. We uh, are very much convinced. So, on behalf of uh, the intergroup, I'd like to thank Mr. Schmidt and the uh, uh, whole of the European Commission, but more particularly Mr. Schmidt, because when we talk with him, we see that he loves what he does. It's not only a job for him, uh, it, it, it's an official job, but it is something more for him. And I think that uh, when a politician, man or woman, 
does something that he loves and that he believes in, I think that he or she is the best person for that job. And I'm quite sure that uh, this plan is not going to be just a document or an initiative that's going to remain on the table. And I'm sure that it will have practical consequences. And it is a new page that's been turned. Uh, it's a new way, a new phase. And I would also like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Schmidt uh, because uh, he referred to a meeting that uh, took place uh, in 2006, more or less, that happened in Italy. It was a big meeting that was organized by Mr. Richie Boba, and I think that he's listening to us. And uh, well, it was uh, a, a, a very important meeting, and after that, uh, the European Commission remained silent. Uh, there was nothing that was done in the last years. And so we have to go back to Mr. Barnier, Mr. Andor, Mr. Tajani to remember initiatives on behalf of the Commission in that field. So as I said, a new page has been, has been turned. It's open for us, for our activity. Now, two points I'd like to mention, and I'm going to be very brief because we've heard already many, many things, and I think you have to judge as all this information. So the first point is that the European Commission has launched this and uh, the intergroup uh, is also going to work on, on this, uh, but I think that it's also very important, and Mr. Schmidt mentioned that, uh, that we have to move the Council, because if there is no strong commitment and official commitment of the Council, the efforts of the Commission and of the Parliament are not going to be as successful as they should be, that is in terms of implementation. So we need a recommendation of the Council, uh, we need uh, different documents, uh, at least something official that should be done, because the commitment is required at that level. Because I think that the opportunity of our national plan that's uh, uh, the, the, about the recovery fund, well, in Italy, we call that a PNL, and all the countries have such an action plan. So in this uh, action plan, uh, there is the possibility to integrate the topic and the world of the social economy, the startups, the cooperatives, and so on and so forth, but also many of the topics. Uh, so we have many different topics uh, that uh, we can include in the, those plans. Uh, and, uh, and this topic must be central, not on the margin or on the side. It's something that uh, must be represented as a stakeholder of all this. And I think that the opportunity is this national resilience uh, action plan. I know that not all the countries uh, gave the same importance to that sector, did not give the same space to make sure that the social system of health and of the other sectors can be developed. So it's important for the Council to say something about this because I think that it means that this action plan would acquire its real importance. It would not be considered as something additional or something just a little part of the national, the national plans. And there are some adjustments or some renewals that are needed. So, and concerning the parliament, uh, we know that we have a very strong, strong commitment there. And I speak on behalf of the whole intergroup because uh, we new, need a new push, a new impulse. Uh, and starting in January with my colleagues, we're going to develop a stronger capacity. We're going to be more present in the European parliament with different initiatives. But you know, it's a very special year, a year and a half. We've had to, to uh, work differently, so it was more difficult to be influenced in the European policy. But at the same time, um, alongside the work of the intergroup, we have colleagues who have also uh, worked. Uh, um, we have uh, in the ECHO uh, committee, for instance, uh, the IMPEC committee, and in the legal committee, we have reports from different members. But also, well, they refer to specific uh, things, the legal framework, for instance, or, or, or the philanthropy and so on and so forth. So we cannot already talk about a, a 360 degrees uh, vision, but we are pushing those topics. Uh, and um, 
it's important for the European Parliament to express itself concerning this. And if we share opinions, we can put things together and we can strengthen our influence on the action plan. So it shows that there is a will at the level of the European Parliament to act, uh, to uh, make statements and to try and bring solutions. Uh, and um, in January, the first meeting we will have uh, will consist in a debate uh, with uh, the colleagues uh, of the Commission that are preparing their initiative reports to discuss about our contribution and we share about the contents, of course. The action plan is referring to main topics, but we can be engines, we can be driving forces, we can do things in the European Parliament to give legs to this plan, because uh, we want this idea to become a, a, a real program, a concrete program. And so... Uh, that's the first part, the tools. We have to consider that the tools that we can develop are very important so that we can translate those ideas and those proposals and those intentions into something concrete. We must very concretely support and in the right direction the world of social economy and uh, and the entities of the social economy. And then we have to make sure that they have financial tools that are better adapted that can be more easily used. And uh, the action plan stated clearly, but at the same time, we have to do something about this in the European Parliament because uh, uh, we considered that the topic of social economy uh, should and could be an eligible topic. But at the same time, uh, we have to specify how and we have to support the world of social economy to be able to use the plan. And the second point is that uh, we have to talk about uh, the funding of social economy. The, 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 the funding should be made available. And in the first intervention of Mr. Schmidt and of Mr. Breton as well, I, I think that it's been mentioned that the social economy is part of, uh, uh, the, uh, of the market, of the single market, uh, in order to try to remedy to the problems of the official economy. So um, it means that we have to have possibilities uh, as social economy, but it also means that the rules of the economy of the single market be adapted, uh, taking into account the different topics that are dealt with by those entities. Uh, and we have to make sure that the quality is there because we want to make a positive difference. And then the third and last point is... Um, is a more general comment concerning the possibilities uh, to offer opportunities to the social economy in uh, the uh, in the new uh, wor world of uh, labor so uh, we have uh, uh, many changes that happened uh, in uh, Europe uh, and we have to be green. We have to be digital as well. That's a big change. And I think that uh, working opportunities uh, coming from the digital world uh, should be made available to cooperatives as well and social companies. Uh, and well, these are topics that you are very familiar with. Uh, so we have to talk about three transitions, in fact. Uh, so the green transition, the digital transition, and the social transition as well. So this uh, means that we have to make sure that people have work, that people are trained, and that uh, everything is done so that it is possible for men and women with our society to work and to have a decent work. And uh, the third transition, that's not very often mentioned. In fact, we talk about green transition, digital transition, and then we are reminded that there is also the social dimension. But uh, for me, it's uh, at the same level. It's the three dimensions that have to be uh, put on the table at the same level. So these are my elements of reflection and my conclusion will be that uh, Mr. Schmidt and the European Commission, because, well, Mr. Schmidt is not on his own, is very much supported by the European Parliament. And so we'll see how we can indeed support him so that, that this very good plan can be transformed into something as concrete as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Patrizia for sharing his perspective from the European Parliament. And you mentioned that it's important for the Council to now take the relay, to take the baton from the European Commission, to take it forward. And that's a nice bridge to our next speaker, because David Ehar represents Member State, uh, France, and of course the presidency that's about to start in a few days. So I imagine his, his uh, to-do list is very long. Uh, David, can you share with us how the French presidency is going to take this forward? What initiatives and activities are you going to put in place to start implementing this action plan? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation and allow me to, first of all, uh, excuse me on behalf of Mr. Liglis Costa, uh, permanent representation of France to the EU, who unfortunately is participating to the European Council today. And the uh, permanent representation altogether is right now uh, divided uh, to prepare the best possible the last phase of. Uh, of the preparations for the presidency of the council that we will have the honor to take over since the 1st January. I would like to thank the other participants of the panel, Mr. Pedrino and Mrs. Toya, who are both particularly expert actors on this topic with a very strong commitment for the longest time in order to promote, develop a social economy at European scale, including within the framework of the European policies, within the parliament, and the presentation of the action plan in this framework for the social economy by the European Commission is a very positive sign of the political will of Commissioner Schmidt, uh, whom we thank for his personal commitment and for the commitment that he has been showing us as Commissioner. And obviously it is a very positive signal also from all of the Commission, because this communication on an action plan for social economy really tackles all of the problems and issues, the barriers that exist to the development of a social economy within the member states. And it designs some possible solutions on European scale that uh, need to be implemented with the will of uh, member states with concrete initiatives on local, regional and national levels. We share a little technical issue. Please bear with us. There it is. We share the uh, remarks made on social economy on European scale. France has a certain experience as other member states. It is a long tradition, important tradition in terms of social economy. It's a concept that uh, is still maybe too unknown and uh, little shared within the EU. And that is also one of our um, goals with this action plan during the 10 years going from 2020 to 2030 to make sure that the spirit of social economy, its tools, its uh, objectives are uh, as widespread as possible because we are putting an accent even beyond the EU. So it has to be widespread within the EU, but even beyond with an international accent. This is another interesting approach. We have to make sure that it doesn't uh, stay a priority already developed and put forward mobilizing um, stakeholders in some member states, but that it really flourishes all over the EU, all over Europe, because as MEP mentioned, 
it's really linked to all the ecosystems with proximity and social economy that are recognized within the industry of uh, European economy. And with this, they play their role within the transitions, the environmental transition, the digital transition, and the climate transition that are already ongoing in many countries. So it represents an opportunity to anticipate and accompany these deep changes that our societies are facing. In France, social economy is a big part of the GDP. I think we mentioned 10% of the GDP in France, and that is an important part of the employment share as well, in particular, the uh, professional requalification of vulnerable citizens. We know all their all of their um, contribution, of their diversity within the economy and the possibilities of uh, social economy to uh, diversify and um, keep vulnerable people and people who are facing personal and societal difficulties to keep them in, uh, in the employment position. Everything that has been said is perfectly consistent with the priorities that will be at the heart of the French presidency during the next semester. So MEP Toya also invited the council to uh, take up this challenge uh, with specific actions to put in, to implement this uh, action plan. I think that everyone who has spoken today have they're part of uh, responsibility and everybody at the council also will have to uh, tackle this task for uh, the French presidency, but also the following presidencies. And unfortunately, mm -hmm, each presidency only lasts six months, but we will be able to work with our partners who will be members of our trial of presidencies in order to ensure continuity within the council so that the council uh, can truly implement this opportunity and initiative to make sure that member states can favor social economy. And we expect the commission and uh, the all together stakeholders and uh, social economy stakeholders, as well as traditional economy stakeholders uh, contribute to feed the content of these recommendations offered by the Commission and adopted by the Council. And regarding this, and this will be my concluding point, the French Presidency uh, welcomes all of this debate and reflections and this action plan and uh, will promote it during an event co-organized by France with the European Parliament, the Social and Economic uh, European Committee, the European Commission and the uh, Strasbourg city on 17 and 18 February 2022 in Strasbourg. And the title of this event will be Social Economy, the Future of Europe. This truly reflects uh, the opportunity that we see for social economy to become, uh, to see its barriers lift it and deploy its full potential in terms of creating jobs and answering all the challenges in uh, terms of uh, environment, society, and economy. Obviously, um, all the representatives uh, and participants will be invited, as well as the ministers of all member states that are in charge of uh, creating national policies in favor of social economy and Olivier Grégoire, our state secretary in charge of uh, solidarity, uh, solidar economy in France will organize a ministerial meeting to try to gather the propositions and priorities of the different member states in order to offer a contribution to social economy on a European level within the uh, implementation of this action plan. 
Uh, thank you very much, and particularly for the invitation to participate in the conference that you're convening in Strasbourg in February. I'm sure many people will take up your invitation to have the dialogue at a next level. So thank you. Let me now turn to the last member of my panel to help us understand the Commission's put forward an action plan, and yet we have a vibrant set of stakeholders in the room and online, 10% of GDP and 13 million people working in the social economy sector. So here's the question, how can the social economy stakeholders be involved in taking the plan forward and getting it implemented? Bueno, pues buenas tardes. Muchas gracias en nombre de Social Economy Europe para intervenir en este, en este debate. Me gustaría volver un poco a, a, al inicio y decir que hoy estamos en un día de celebración, un día de ilusión para toda la economía social. Tiene que significar un punto de inflexión en el cambio de escala de la representación que las empresas de economía social quieren tener en Europa. Y no conozco ningún avance de la economía social que se haya realizado sin un trabajo en conjunto. Eh, habría que recordar eh, la declaración del Consejo de Ministros de 2015, donde por primera vez todos los gobiernos de la Unión Europea deciden que la economía social es un elemento clave para el futuro de Europa. En ese punto, el comisario Smith era ministro de Luxemburgo. Ese fue uno de los puntos principales. Para que este plan de acción vea la luz hoy, han tenido que contribuir muchas instituciones to, to y muchas personas, to, el comisario Díaz, el comisario Bretón, los equipos del comisario Díaz Bretón, el Parlamento Europeo, el Intergrupo de Economía Social, el Comité Económico Social Europeo, el Grupo de Expertos, los gobiernos de los países que están implantando medidas de economía social en cada uno de los países, Francia, Portugal, España, y sobre todo hemos tenido que poner en marcha para llegar aquí muchas conferencias Here, we had to create a lot of conferences about social economy throughout the world. And the result of all of this process is here today. We have a very important document, very pertinent document, that gives the European Union with a strategy to develop a model of companies that coincide with all of the values that the European Union defends. Sustainability, Green Deal, de las desigualdades, el desarrollo local, bueno, uh, coincide. Y esos son eh, los principios que sostienen a las propias empresas de economía that, social. Pero es que además este documento uh, eh, nos dota, dota de, un, de, un, eh, de una estrategia eh, para poner en valor a la propia economía social y a las familias de la propia economía social. Bueno, pues partiendo de este apartado, nosotros tenemos un índice de crecimiento importantísimo y el, y el plan de acción nos va a dotar de, una, de algo muy importante. Primero, quiere poner en valor cómo se puede expandir la economía social en Europa y quiere facilitar los medios. Nos facilita los medios. Va a trabajar sobre la, la legislación, va a trabajar sobre el tema de financiación, la fiscalidad, en fin, una serie de valores, en este caso, que la contratación pública responsable, pero también nos va a dotar de una definición muy necesaria para el conjunto de la economía Una definición común, comprensiva, una definición inclusiva, clara, que respeta al resto de las familias, y que eh, no crea tensión ni crea discrepancia en este momento. Bueno, pues ahora viene el reto. Nosotros But tenemos desde nuestra organización, well, from desde nuestras organizaciones, que sumar y que hacer que los países, cada uno de los países, ponga en marcha una estrategia de economía social en cada uno de los países. Decía el comisario Smith esta mañana, bueno, al comienzo de la sesión, que oyó en Italia que la economía social tenía un potencial increíble. Pero es que yo creo que nosotros, ni tan siquiera nosotros sabemos el potencial que tiene la economía social. Hay países que tienen en este momento entre un 8 y un 10% de PIB en la economía social. Pero hay países que tienen un 0,6%. El potencial de crecimiento es enorme. Seguramente si fuéramos conscientes de que 
pensando de 6,3, 6,5, nuestra capacidad de influencia en las políticas europeas y en la política de cada uno de los países policies, sería tremenda. Podríamos influir muchísimo más en la política de cada uno y hacer lo que se pretende es realmente un ecosistema europeo de economía social. Crear un ecosistema europeo de economía social solo se puede conseguir primero desde el conjunto, segundo desde el apoyo de todos los países. Se, tercero, desde la influencia de las organizaciones de la economía social, en este sentido. Uh, Tenemos una oportunidad increíble. So Creo que en este momento, eh, right el sector, esta mañana los comisarios nos han puesto además la pelota en nuestro tejado. Nos han dicho, a, uh, ahora os toca a vosotros. Us, claro, ahora nos toca a nosotros. Yes, es lo que tenemos que hacer. Recuerdo una, una metáfora de un poeta que al final que viene a decir que cuando el río va hacia el océano, eh, le entra mucho miedo. Mira hacia atrás y ve que hay montañas, que ha pasado por montañas, que ha pasado por lagos, que ha pasado por, por llanuras, y le da mucho miedo lo que ha pasado. Ve que se acerca al océano, que no hay vuelta atrás, y que teme desaparecer. El miedo solo se le pasa cuando entra en el océano, porque no desaparece, se convierte en océano. Y eso es lo que nosotros tenemos que hacer, sumar esfuerzos, sumar esfuerzos conjuntos para hacer que efectivamente este documento relevante, importante, muy significativo, que nos está generando muchísima ilusión, pues tenga esa capacidad de promover el crecimiento sostenido de la economía social en Europa y en cada uno de los países. Creo que tenemos la oportunidad tremenda de dejar a un lado a veces eh, ciertas cuestiones particulares, evitar, evitar, y esto es importante, evitar que otras empresas con piel de economía social quieran entrar en la economía social y aprovecharse de esas ventajas que podamos tener. Hay que evitar eso. Y yo creo que en definitiva tenemos esa oportunidad tremenda de potenciar, de potenciar el valor de desarrollo de fomento de la economía social en Europa. Both financing, legal, and recognition and status, but it also needs to take courage and to accept the responsibility to step up and take its rightful place in the, the shift and the change of the economy that we're going to be seeing in the post pandemic uh, era. The financial mechanisms are there. We've heard that there's funding available. Member states are starting to reflect on this, but as you say, there are some countries where The social economy is well established and has a clear role to play and is recognized as such, and others where it's tiny. So the potential across Europe to share expertise and combine forces in order to create, you know, the strong river of the social economy to go to the sea, I think has great potential. So thank you to Juan, thank you to David and to Patricia for sharing this final panel where we looked at how to take the initiative from the European Commission, the action plan that was launched today and turn it into something living that can be taken forward by all stakeholders. We've come to the end of our time today and it's been a wonderful afternoon. I've been deeply inspired by some of our social entrepreneurs sharing their stories. I was challenged by some of the visions from uh, Professor Yunus. It was such a privilege to have a chance to talk to one of the great initiators of the social economy movement. We have an open invitation from the two commissioners at the beginning to say, our work is done. We created the plan. Now it's your turn to take it forward. Be bold, ask for help, come and see us put your ideas to the test. So now we leave it to you, the stakeholders, to take it forward. Thank you all for participating. I'd like to say a warm thank you to those of you who chose to come here and trust that we could organize still an event under these conditions. To those of us who are watching at home and the people who made it happen. So there is an entire bank of computers at the back of this hall with lots of technicians. Without them, We couldn't have had this. We had translators who ensured that our French and, and Spanish speaking colleagues were able to participate. And the team at the European Commission in DG Employment who worked so hard, not just to get the action plan written, but then under incredibly tough circumstances who had a bit of courage and decided to go ahead and we could still hold this event and it was still possible to celebrate 
what the social economy could be for Europe. So I'm going to close us with a big round of thank you all. And at the invitation of, of David, our next rendezvous will be Strasbourg in February to see how we take it forward. So thank you, be safe, and see you in 2022. Happy holidays. <laughs>